You stand on the shore of the ocean watching the tide come in. You sense the call of the sea beckoning to take you in further. You step forward little by little not knowing what to expect, but expecting more. You keep going as the ocean calls, calls you to enter in to deeper waters. Welcome to the Deeper Waters Podcast. I am Nick Peters, your host, and I'm always seeking to bring you the best in Christian apologetics and scholarship. And uh, we today have a great program lined up that definitely falls in that category. I like to imagine you're in the situation where someone comes up to you and says, I'd like to play a little game with you and see if you can identify the person that I'm talking about. And you say, okay. He says, all right. This person was born of a virgin, he had 12 disciples, he was known as the savior of the world at this time, he performed many miracles, he was a great traveling teacher, he was a good shepherd, way, truth, light, redeemer, he had a relig- he had a Lord's Supper by David as far as he was seen as the lion and the lamb, he died and he rose again later on, who am I talking about? Now most of you are going to think, well, that's pretty obvious. You're talking about Jesus Christ. I mean, the person you're talking to says, Nope, I'm talking about Mithras. Now, a lot of people are, are going to be caught flat-footed at that. And if you're on the internet, you're going to hear that Jesus is a copy of pagan religions constantly. Is that the case? Well, my guest today says, No, that is most definitely not the case. My guest is Joe Morva here. He's got a Master of Arts in Theological Studies, Magnum Cum Laude from Lee University. And he's invited back to give the address of a 200th centennial celebration. He's currently a, in a PhD program at Radboud University in the Netherlands. And he's spoken on various topics at Georgia Tech, Kennesaw State University, Lee University, and Georgia State University. And he's spoken on various topics at dozens of churches over the last decade, 10 years teaching experience, two at Lee University, eight with juniors and seniors at Mount Paran Christian School, Eagle Award winner, Excellence in Teaching Award, Interim Department Chair of, Ex- Chair of Bible and Theology. He's been doing this kind of thing for 10 years. He comes even highly recommended by William Lane Craig. My guest is Joe Marva here. Joe, welcome to the Deeper Waters Podcast. Thanks, Nick. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, man. Well, that's your good academic introduction, at least I hope you think it's good, but um, <laughs> yeah. most people might not know who you are. Yeah. So tell us a little about who you are and how you got to be doing what you're doing today. Well, uh, beyond just the subject at hand, uh, when I got out of college, um, my family, uh, I had a job lined up for me in the family business, which is a travel business. Mm-hmm. Uh, we take uh, set up tours, group tours uh, for uh, senior citizens, college age, high school age, and uh, I would. Uh, it was a dream job. I got mm-hmm. to travel the world. Uh, even when I got engaged, I got to take my uh, 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 wife with me after we were married uh, mm-hmm. on the road. And you know, Nick, I I, I was raised in a in a, in a Christian uh, setting. I went two years to a Christian school. My last two years of of, of high school. Uh, always, you know, in the church uh, throughout my life, and I, you know, as I travel around, uh, I started to find out I had, I was, I was really afraid of evangelism. So, uh, you know, whenever I start, especially, you know, not only travel domestic, when you start traveling international, you know, people would want to sit, at, you know, whether it was a tour guide or a bus driver or just a, a, a person you met or a, a shop owner. They want to talk about these big issues, these big, you know, origin, meaning, morality, destiny issues that the Zacharias uh, team talks about. And I, I, I had nothing to say after a, after a lifetime of, uh, of of being in church, and, and you know, and that's some you can blame the parents, the family took some of this, and the, you know, I, I knew quite a bit about the Bible, but I really, really hated the Great Commission. I couldn't mm-hmm. stand. It. Uh, because primarily, I, you know, it's just like anything else in life, right? If you don't really know what you're talking about or not interested in the subject, you'll get someone to change the subject. You're at a party and you, 
you hear somebody talking about, I don't know, something really I'm really ignorant about, like uh, European men's soccer, amongst many other things, mm-hmm. you'll either wait for them to change the subject or try to change the subject if you oh, yes. part of that conversation. So the fact that I had never trained or even looked at any other perspective but that one singular one, and I was now in context where the Bible wasn't taken for granted anymore. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't want to share at all, but I found myself with a lot of spare time on the road between, you know, when you could be on a flight or on a bus or waiting for a group to finish a, a tour. I had a lot of time, so I started reading, and uh, reading quite a bit. And then evangelism started to become a, a lot easier once you start understanding where uh, these other uh, uh, religious traditions, people that were adhered to these other religious traditions, where they come from. Mm-hmm. So... I'd start to look forward to witnessing on the road and not beat someone over the head, but asking questions and showing them that I respected them enough to, to try to investigate what they say the answers to these, to these reality questions were. And it got to a point where uh, my wife didn't want me to leave the family business. They were grooming me for a takeover. And um, she came on me on a couple of trips and said, I, I've never seen anything like this. This is just awesome. And I said, yeah, I just, you know, it's, it's really the Lord. This thing is going, I mean, he's bringing this stuff up. He it, 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 it brings it to your mind, your remembrance. And people were saying, am I on camera? I mean, it sounds like a, you, this, this whole conversation was a setup from beginning to end. And when this happens a couple dozen times, you start to not, not really sweat evangelism anymore. In fact, you look forward to it. Mm-hmm. So my wife begrudgingly said, you've got to try to teach people how to do this. So this, was, this began the journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I went and worked for Zacharias Ministries for a while just as a, a research guy, as a background guy when I left the family business and started my master's, started my master's program and well, took the, hard, the, the, the most difficult route I could to, see, to test these ideas. Uh, it, it, I was really, really quite happy with how the apologetics reading I'd done on my own up to that point. It really aided me in that, in that, uh, in that, in that journey uh, through mm-hmm. the graduate studies program. And then afterwards, I got recruited to uh, work at a, a pretty prestigious academy down here in North Georgia, Mount Perrin School, and, and teach kids how to do this sort of thing and just understand these other, these other issues so that they felt comfortable around people. Quite frankly, they thought they were crazy. Mm-hmm. Since we're throwing these kids over the wall and into a college setting when they've been in these sort of bubbles before, it, I, I've had a lot. I've been blessed, to be honest with you, Nick. I, I've had, I mean, there's mission, missionaries that are on the, out the field for years, and they, they may never see the fruit of their labors, but the Lord's been gracious enough to let me see a lot of the fruit of the labors, and it's, it's been a really good fit. Um, as a matter of fact, your uh, father-in-law, uh, Mike Lacona, a good friend of mine, uh, is the one who kind of, you know, I was looking to PhD programs, and he wanted me hooked up with a guy that he had a wonderful time, and a very rigorous scholar, Jan Vanderwatt. Uh, he's at a different university. He was at uh, Pretoria University when he was with Mike. Mm-hmm. Now he's at uh, Red Boot in the Netherlands, and he hooked me up with Jan, and the rest is history. I'm you know, about five years into this PhD process mm-hmm. and still teaching and still speaking. And this is the, the PhD that, I, that they accepted, the, the idea of the parallels thesis, the idea that the, 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 the gospel writers sort of picked up these things and, and mimicked them. And so, you know, along the way, I've, you know, we've got, I've got a pretty big family, four kids and a wife, and, you know, trying to keep everything in front of me. And by God's mercy, it's been, it's been really quite productive. So I've been really, really quite happy. Now, when you speak about the Zacharias Trust and such, you mean Robbie Zacharias, right? Absolutely. Yes, Robbie Zacharias International Ministries. Yeah. I had no idea. I'd, I'd read a number of his books and listened to a lot of his audio, even back in the day before, uh, before he really had a huge Internet presence. And when I found out his, one of his home offices of the four worldwide was here in Atlanta and that he lived here in Atlanta, this is his own base, I went and worked and said, I've got to go work for this guy. You know, it's kind of funny. <laughs> their, their offices are, you know, a little north of Atlanta. Uh, when I was, I had this hiatus between uh, quitting the travel business, much to the chagrin of my extended family, and before I'd start my, my graduate studies program and before I would move uh, from Georgia to Tennessee. And so I just went and worked for them for free. And everybody was looking at me like I was some sort of spy or something. Why is he here for free? Why is he working here mm-hmm. and he's doing this grunt work for free? And I, mm-hmm. I just, I'd always tell them the same thing. Look, if there was a C.S. Lewis Institute in Atlanta that was literally where he lived and where his home base was, I'd go do free work for him just to kind of give a little back. So that's where I, you know, I, I did that and did the graduate studies. And then when I got back to Atlanta, I, I caught wind. And, well, it's funny if you, you ask. I, when I got done with my graduate studies and started at Mount Perrin, got recruited down here to teach apologetics at the academy, uh, I had a parent come in and see a picture of Bill Craig on the wall. And they said, hey, that's my Bible study teacher. And I said, sir... 
I was so incredulous, Nick. I said, mm-hmm. sir, we're going to be fine. Your kid's going to do okay in here. You don't have to try to create this false bridge with me. Mm-hmm. And he said, no, 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 that, 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 that's my Bible study teacher. And I was, I was convinced that he was still in Europe. I didn't know he moved to Atlanta, largely for the airport. Mm-hmm. And so I bet the guy. I said, look, I bet you 10 bucks. Uh, that's not Bill Cray, that you're mistaken. I, said, I tell you, you're on. You come at 11 o'clock, John Perry Baptist Church. Sure enough, there's Bill Craig. I meet him. And I'm just shocked. I'm floored. I'm like, I've listened to everything. And I end up, you know, he, Bill still laughs about it today because the, the first thing I said to him when I met him was I said, you know, you're a lot more personable than you come off in your debates. <laughs> you know, I said, you're, uh, and he said, well, that's a backhanded compliment. And I said, well, you come off like a logic chopping Terminator. But you really are a winsome and very engaging personality, just unbelievable. So, mm-hmm. you know, I really showed my ignorance because I, you know, I'd only read his formal work and some of his philosophical works. I hadn't really engaged him. But that, that's been, a, again, a six-year friendship that's been just absolutely unbelievable. Uh, I just uh, uh, filled in for him uh, uh, just a couple weeks ago while he was in the U.K. at the Apostolic Conference there. So it's, it's been really good. It's been really good to be – and then to meet Mike through all this because Mike – I met Mike through Gary. Uh, Gary, uh, Bill invited Gary to the apologetic conference, and I said, oh, gosh, Gary, I don't know if i got to meet this guy, and you know how cool Gary is. You've had him on the show, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah and... He's, uh, he's just, he's the guy's guy, right? And he's yep. going to give the skeptic even more, even just, I mean, he's going to give him even more than he probably should in, in, a, in a dialogue or a debate, but, you know, mm-hmm. Gary's just, he's just a beast. Yeah. So, yeah. And just a great guy, and, a, and, a, and a, mm-hmm. just, you can imagine, he's a great mentor as well. I think you mentioned that he had spent some time with you, helping you work through some doubt as well. Uh, yeah, mainly building up my own confidence and such. And sure. we, we were talking to the show beforehand, but he was the one who introduced me to Audi, pretty yeah, much. Yes. And the part of that that we never really got to was he was also the one who married us. Oh, he, he, he did the ceremony. Yes. Oh man, that's cool. So you owe him a lot. <laughs> oh yes, and I'm guessing with Bill Craig, that was probably the best ten bucks you've ever spent, right? Oh gosh, absolutely. Well, I felt like such an idiot, though, because the guy was absolutely right. And so, you know, one of the next questions I asked Bill was, well, why aren't you in Belgium or <laughs> Germany? You know, where, why, why are you here? And he's like, well, here again. It's nice to meet you, too. But uh, but I said, no, I just got to know because I was sure you are not you weren't here in domestic. And he said, well, basically, I, I wanted a large, vibrant Christian community, John Perry Baptist Church. And I, uh, you know, I, the airport. He goes, Joe, this, this airport gets you nearly anywhere the quickest, in my opinion. So, uh and he's right, you know, the uh, Hartsfield International is a, is, a, is a big, giant hub. Maybe, I think, now the biggest, if not second largest uh, in, in the state. So, mm. anyway, yeah, that's, that's the, the story about my interaction with Bill and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and my time with him. I've, you know, uh, done research work with him. I've taught for him. I mean, he's endorsed me in a number of ways. He even wrote my recommendation for my Ph.D. program. So, that's, that's mm. really cool as well. It was actually unnerving, just to be honest with you. I don't, when you ask Bill Craig to write your recommendation. You can imagine, you'll probably, you know, he, he might say no, but he just said this. He turned back to me and said, you write it, and then I'll check and see whether I agree with it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when somebody says that, you're kind of right to go, mm. when I, when you say this about me, mm. I don't know, is this adjective too strong? You know, this sort of thing. So anyway, uh, that's, that's how it's been going, Bill, but he's a great guy. Bill and Jan are just unbelievable, absolutely incredible people. I mean, when you hear people on, online that don't know him, and, and say that Bill Craig is, you know, he's just, he's, uh, you know, just this sort of a, 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 you know, used car salesman, and, you know, he's just a, a guy that really is just a self-aggrandizing, self-promoting, to call Bill Craig a self-promoting arrogant, you just, you don't know him, it just, it just highlights your ignorance, you have no idea, you know, the guy is the furthest thing from arrogance, and if you want to talk self-promotion, he works out of his basement, for goodness sake, I mean, even Zacharias has a, a better offices than Bill does. His office is his basement, his secretary is his wife. So if it's, it's not self-promotion, it's people rightly taking, taking grasp of the fact that this guy has done a lot of work and takes, takes the skeptic seriously enough to engage them. I mean, I, I, I'm hard-pressed to name another, another person of another era that's been more prone to get in and win debates against skeptics than Bill. I mean, he's, he's yeah, I, just easily one of the top Christian intellectuals on the planet. I don't think that's an exaggeration at all. Hey, so what got you into the pagan copycat idea? Uh, you know, Nick, it's a real interesting... Well, I don't know. I think it's interesting that your, your listeners may say, ah, it's boring. But I, I had a student come in to my class, uh, my fourth year teaching, 
And this kid was not given to tears, but he was in tears. I won't say his name mm -hmm. because we're doing this uh, for the public. But this uh, kid comes in, and he's 18 years uh, in a Christian home, 18 years in a Christian church. Uh, he'd been at our school for 11 years. Mm -hmm. And his friends had shown him zeitgeist. Oh, gosh. Peter Joseph, you know, you, I'm, you know why you're, I know exactly, you, we both know why you're saying, oh, gosh. Two hours of my life wasted. Come on, come on, you know it. So we're, hopefully we'll be able to talk about that a little bit. But the, he was ready to crush the thing, man. And I had no clue. I'm not, you're, <laughs> your listeners are going to find out I'm not, not the most tech-savvy guy out there. I love tech, but I'm not. I don't have a big internet footprint. All all the apologists that are in my life said, you've got to do this. So I'm trying to, you know, hey, four kids trying to get it together and doing research, heavy research like this. But bottom line is I, I said, Duncan, uh, let me watch it tonight. Oh, gosh, I said his name. Sorry. Um, uh, it, let me watch it tonight, and uh, we'll talk about it. So he came in the next day, and I said I watched it. And I said, you know, I don't know anything about this subject. I don't think I've ever heard anybody make these comparisons which should tell you something. I've read extensively about the Gospels, and I engage with critics of the Gospels all the time. The fact that I haven't heard this particular critique should tell you something. So that's the first thing. It's not an answer, but it's just this. When critics are taking aim at the Gospels, when I first investigated this, I went, I told, I told the kid, I said, look, you need to know that this is not, if it were as strong as it was presented in this video, you'd have more critics take it up as their, their singular or, or uh they're, they're singular, you know, tip of the spear type thing. And so then I said, listen, given the number of claims in this, we need to meet together. This isn't going to do for a quick, you know, microwave oven, McDonald's fast food answer. Yeah. Um, so we need to meet together for, if you can commit to me for an hour a day for the next two weeks after school, we'll work through this and get you to a place where you're fine. Well, uh, we did, and he was, he did end up being fine, but... I couldn't believe it shook him so much. Now, he had a peer group that built it up big time. They showed him the other Peter Joseph conspiracy videos about 9-11 and about the World Bank and, and the Fed. Mm -hmm. And then they said, you don't want to watch this next one. And he said, what do you mean? And they said, well, you know, we just you don't want to watch it, trust me. So what does he do, right? He's going he home, goes home, goes to bed, and he keeps waking up, mm -hmm. sitting up in bed, looking at his, his laptop, right, Nick? Mm -hmm. He yep. keeps looking at it, going, what are they talking about? Mm -hmm. And so when he watches it, it's, you know, it's, 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 I guess you could say slickly made and the, and the, and, the, and very very and it kind of you know when you watch it it has that tone of get with it. Mm -hmm. I'm sick of having to talk to you people because it's so <laughs> obvious this is such low hanging fruit these ideas that you should have already known about this. So get with it, right? Mm -hmm. And even that tone gets people to go, oh man, I you know am I missing? Am I out of the loop here? Am I but you know am I benighted because I've been raised in a Christian home they've never discussed this? So it really capitalizes on people's ignorance in a number of areas, and that's. That's something that – I think that's also why, you know, there's been work done on this, why the second that Peter Joe the follow-up, I guess, too, just tanked. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I, I also had a couple of students that would, went to generally conservative, though secular uh, universities where they'd show Peter Joe's video out on the quad to anyone to walk by and serve pizza and drinks to watch this video on a college campus. You know, some of these were the same campuses where they had had trouble getting a Ratio Christi together, a fellowship of Christian athletes. So, mm -hmm. but by gosh, we can put a screen up and show Peter Joseph's mockumentary uh, up on campus. And so I had trained a couple to be ready for this sort of thing. So they were able to kind of talk to people that had witnessed this sort of thing. So, you know, if it's, if it's on campus and like Friday night, movie night, and it's also being presented on the Internet as having some substance to it, I think... One of the illusions Peter Joseph's able to pull, you know, kind of pull the wool over people's eyes is he says, "Look, I've got, you know, hundreds of footnotes here." Yeah. And when you start isolating the crucial footnotes to, to, you know, that are supposed to decimate Christianity, you find that the scholars, quote unquote, that he pulls either aren't scholars, in other words, they're, ac they're amateur academics. Doesn't necessarily make them wrong because they're not professional scholars. But you also find that these have been largely repudiated. These scholars, or they're out of date, or even even skeptics have have issue with some of these scholars. So. That kind of got me in the direction of doing this, and I found, wow, there's a lot of people. This started to become a popular, you know this, since Zeitgeist, it has become a popular Internet sensation yeah. and, and, and this commonly claimed thing. Put in a Google search and you see it yourself. Uh, and I suppose there's something to be said for the idea that, uh, you know, how did Mal the Hill, this happens all the time, right? Joe, look, I, you know, there are people that run ahead of the scholarly data all the time. This is part of our world, but... This has gotten 
quite uh, way too common for just a little pet thing in a corner. Um, if you go into the scholarship on the subject, though, I mean, the hard scholarship with people that have earned degrees by spending a large portion of their life studying and being vetted by people that have also done this, you find this this is a this is a thesis without a champion, largely. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a fringe thing that no one really takes seriously in the academic world. And I think I can say that without being unfair, Nick. It's, it's the yeah. minute you start delving into the, are there real scholars that sink their teeth into this, or, or is this what they would call internet or Wikipedia research, right? Where it's pseudo uh, or sat scholarship, not, not authentic, and you really start to find that, Man, there's a lot of stretching. There's a lot of uh, speculation. There's a lot of bridging of evidential gaps. It's it's quite quite interesting. Yeah, I don't I don't think even Richard Carrier takes this seriously. No, no. And what's interesting is he would agree with some of the very very broad outlines of some of the ideas here, but he is the first to say there are so many excesses in this position. Mm. Um, but even even Richard Carrier, right? He doesn't. Yeah. That's a great. I interact with him in my in my doctoral uh, dissertation. Even Carrier uh, would say, "Look, I I think there might have been an archetype or a motif of dying and rising." By the way, even that mild position is against the scholarly consensus. Not the consensus yeah. means something's true automatically, but even that mild position is against the consensus. And he goes, "I think they kind of grabbed this." But notice, even Carrier will say, "All right, there are other people that have done this that are." I mean, he. He uh, exploriates somebody like Percy Graves. Go to his website. This is a guy that lived uh, over 100 years ago that came up with was one of the first 16 books. Crucified Saviors. And there you go, Percy Graves, 16 Crucified Saviors. He goes after uh, Dolores Murdoch, you know, in Carrie S. and says, yep. these, these are people you need to ignore. Um, uh, so, and, he, and he really, really tries to protect himself from either verifying his thesis or falsifying it, right? Mm. By, by playing it into an archetype scenario or a motif so that you can't really it's hard to get your hands around it to test his theory, right? Mm-hmm. But even he would say there are so many excesses in this, in, in, in this way. So he would say things like, well, you know, don't put me in the category of saying that somebody had, say, like the gospel, like, I don't know, uh, Matthew had Herodotus open beside him. And he was reading Zalmox as well. He was writing the Jesus account. Carrie would say, that's not my position at all. Mm-hmm. That is the position of some of the other amateur academics. But it's, it's not what he's saying at all. So he moves it over into a, a milder framework in order to basically, uh, uh, I think, protect the thesis from either verification or falsification. You know, because if I, if, let's say I make a claim to you, Nick, I live in Atlanta, and you say, well, I'm going to come visit you. I'm going to verify that thesis. Where's your address? And I say, well, it's like Atlanta. It's a, it's a, it's a facsimile of Atlanta. It was, you know, it's based on the Atlanta layout, city layout. Well, where is it? Well, it's it's kind of like Atlanta. There are big buildings, and yeah. small buildings. You know, so you, you can always protect your your theory or your speculation or even your thesis from being tested by continually moving into a vague category. And I think that's something that should maybe be our theme today: is when it, it, you have to remain intentionally, almost in a mendacious, lying way. And uh, not that they're all lying, but you almost have to be intentionally deceptive. In your in, in remaining vague and ambiguous to make this thesis work, you have to do it that way. The minute the minute you place it in context, yeah, you see that there's there is a man. It, it's in a lot of trouble. The theory's in a whole lot of trouble. So um, and and it's funny because I you know this is one of the reasons I got into this research too is when you start reading people that have responded to this that are not just scholars but scholars uh, of of high repute in in our world. For instance, Bruce Metzger wrote a chapter in a book um, years ago on this very subject where he said, well, look, uh, you know, this is, a, it was, his, the, I think the, the chapter, the book was called Historical and Literary Studies, Pagan, Jewish, and Christian. He wrote a chapter in there. Bruce Metzger, the, the, the uh, highly decorated Greek Jedi uh, New Testament scholar, and he wrote an entire, entire chapter on this and said, look, one of, the, one of the things he said amongst many against this idea of pagan copycat is he said, look, you know, yes, I'm a believer, but go read the original sources. I know we don't have a lot of time today and things like this, and in our, our rushed microwave society, we don't have a lot of time to slow down, but one of the best antidotes to the copycat thesis is actually read in context. And I know I'm not the only one saying this. I think yep. uh, Mary Jo Sharp says the same thing. Ron Nash said it in his book, Gospel and the Greeks. But one of the things I thought would be a real benefit to the body of Christ, and I, I had this, I'm doing this in my doctoral presentation, it'll likely be in the book at some point, 
is I actually put the original source in context right there. So you can nice. open your Bible or look at the, the, the remainder of the book and put it right alongside at least the, the features that are, that are proposed to be matched with, say, the Gospels. So you got it right there. So let's say a pastor has a kid come in the room and say, ah, isn't Jesus like Hercules? He can pull this resource off the wall and open up to the Hercules account with the, with the key features and go, does this sound like, right, it's, it's like Jesus? And, and the reason that's important, Nick, is because you know as well as I do, first things first, logic is predicated on distinction. The inability to properly make differentiations and distinctions and categories between things, I mean, logic is a, is a, is a categorization mm -hmm. construct of the mind. If you can't do that and blend everything, you're, you, you've, ensured the, you've ensured the fact that you're not only going to be illogical, you're going to make a spurious connection. I'll give you an example. Joe Maldahill and Nick have ears. Elephants and kangaroos have ears. Joe Maldahill and Nick Peters are elephants and kangaroos. Now, I, I don't want to get, not to get technical, but there's a technical term for that particular fallacy called the fallacy of the undistributed middle. Mm -hmm. You haven't distributed all of the middle distinctives that would render the connection you just made between us and animals suspect. Right. Um, for example, I, I've got four appendages. A table has four appendages. So you can say, well, Mulville is just like a table because we have four appendages. So the question is, well, look, the differences make a difference. And, and uh, this isn't hair splitting here. You have to look in context and say, do these differences defeat <coughs> the commonalities? And, and you've got to ask that with every parallel claim, every parallel claim, and no matter what category you're doing it. So I think the ability to first make distinctions, and that's being eroded by a, sort of a relativistic move in our pluralistic move in our society when it comes to truth and epistemology. And then when you move it over to another category, you've got some other problems because when you're making a parallel claim, it's very, very important to be careful. And you hear this time and time again from people who actually do this for a living, attempt to make the bridge, bridge gaps between certain liter ancient literary sources and even common contemporary literary sources. Well, since you brought it up, let's talk, we're talking about zeitgeist. In case yes. some of my listeners might not know, what is zeitgeist? Zeitgeist is a German word that means idea, or it means ghost of the times. But it's, it, it just is the, the prevailing mood of the time period, is, is what zeitgeist means. This was the title of an internet uh, video uh, produced by and, and created by a gentleman named Peter Joseph, a non-academic, um, not that that, again, these, these, these are just factual claims about Peter Joseph. These, these, these claims yeah. don't automatically make someone wrong. I mean, somebody can be, a child can get a truth right, right? So I mean, right. I, I'm just letting you know, this is not a person that was vetted by anybody. He doesn't have relevant credentials in the field. He's not a professional scholar. He doesn't get paid to do this sort of thing. Um, uh, but Zeitgeist, I think, is at 26 million views now. Um, and it, the, the, the features of Zeitgeist, it's, it's split into three three uh, different chapters that are about, I think, a little over an hour apiece, and they're all conspiracies. Uh, the first is a conspiracy about 9-11, uh, which has been largely debunked, but that's not what the show's about today. So uh, the second is about how there's a conspiracy to control us by way of finances, by the creation, by the creation of certain government structures and uh, the federal bank in Washington, D.C. And then the last one is on the greatest, the greatest conspiracy ever, and it's alleged that Jesus Christ is is just one in a long line of what they would call solar messiahs, where these different people groups, Babylonians, Persians, Romans, Greeks, uh, uh, Sumerians, uh, ancient Jews, all have these deities that were connected to the solar cycle, the, the, the sun and the moon, the agricultural cycle, and every one of these different people groups just did a different take on the the, the solar myth, man, man god, man, god man legend, and all of them have the same features. So you, they would lit. There's a there's a portion of the that's not that's one part that doesn't really bother people. No one really buys the whole you know son of God S O N S U N sun in the sky. I mean you know when you move to the Greek and the Hebrew, those words don't even they're not even phonetically similar. Well, let, let's really be open. let's yeah. make sure about something here. When you say no one buys it, you don't just mean Christian scholars. Oh, gosh, no, 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 no. There are plenty of, of non-Christian, agnostic, and atheistic scholars that have no time for zeitgeist. None mm -hmm. at all. I've got, I, I have a number of them in, in my works, and I've come across them in my research. Um, the, 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 even, even if 
I say, well, there are some truths in zeitgeist. They say they're swamped by lot of like by falsehoods and misleading statements and speculative uh, speculative scenarios that are treated as if they're factual. Can you so name some of these scholars for us? Uh, yes, let me name one. Um, Tim Callahan wrote a book on uh, dealing with the the comparative sort of scenario going on with these uh, with, with zeitgeist and, 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 and people that are popular online and Kyria mm -hmm. S. Um, and even these, these uh, older <laughs> amateur scholars like Percy Graves, mm -hmm. uh, Jeffrey Higgins, mm -hmm. um, uh, Gerald Massey, yep. uh, Alvin Boyd Kuhn, oh. uh, he said, look, you know, there are, there's some truths here and there, <laughs> truths here and there, which says Callahan uh, in his work. And gosh, I tell you, the title is escaping me right now, but you can probably do a Google search, Tim Callahan on Pagan Copycats and get his book. But even he says, no, the problem with all of these people, from Peter Joseph and Karyas, and this guy's not a believer, he's a, he's a member of the uh, United States Skeptics Society, uh, he says that the problem is that they just, that they get more wrong than they get right. For every truthful statement, you have a number of non-truthful, or at least at best misleading, at worst, what they call mendacious or blind. Um, and that's, that's the problem with going to these sources. And by the way, Tim, Tim Callahan's book's been torn apart for the, the his, his, some of his copycat claims. So this is an interesting thing. Give you another example. Um, one of the scholars we haven't discussed yet who does have the relevant credentials and is one of the loudest champions of the, the copycat parallel pagan thesis, I call it the critical pagan parallel thesis, CPPT, um, is Robert Price. Oh, yes. Uh, you know about Robert Price. Robert a friend Price, of a friend. Yeah, oh, well, man, big time French. I mean, he, he thought, what do you call, uh, he called the Jesus Seminar guys too conservatives. You know, so this guy is really, really, you know, quite out there. Uh, but but, but you got to give credit where it's due, right? The guy holds two doctors, right? Yep. One in 1981 in uh, Systematic Theology, followed by a second in New Testament Studies in 1993 from Drew University. Um, you know, but in his book, Deconstructing Jesus and in the Incredible Shrinking Son of Man, uh, interesting title there, but mm. he even goes after these guys and says, look, I, he, I mean, he insults uh, Dolores Murdoch or Antiria S. who wrote, you know, uh, uh, oh, uh, what? She wrote the... Uh, uh, Christ uh, Conspiracy. Conspiracy, uh, what else? Uh, the, the Greatest Story Ever Sold. Mm. You know, this story, uh, she wrote a number of books and has a big internet presence, but he, he goes out of his way to say, this, this, these ideas are absurd. And notice, he is not only an atheist, He's a guy who feels like it's his job in life to to repudiate the Gospels as inspired or even or even something to build a life around, even indirectly. And, and he also believes in the pagan parallel thesis. So he's saying, no, 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 just like Carrier, there are some really pseudo-scholarly excesses going on. And he would lump Peter Joseph in there with Encarius S and some of these these older amateur scholars, like like I mentioned before, uh, you know, Gerald mm. Massey, Alfred, uh, Alvin Boyd, yeah. Dune, uh, uh, and uh, 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 what's his name? Um, uh, uh, I'll call it the, the, the ten, uh, the uh, sixty world sixties crucified saint. Percy Graves. Yeah, 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 Percy Graves. Sorry, I couldn't have blank on Percy. So yeah, so that, that's an example of, of people that aren't in our wheelhouse that say watch out and put big big warning signs around them. And another thing I think would benefit your, your listeners here is to say this. In all my studies, I've been looking. One of the things you want to do in a PhD program is you don't want to charge at a windmill. What does that mean? You don't want to battle something that's not really a substantial criticism, right? right. Uh, you don't want to get into a serious scholarly battle with something that no one takes seriously. So mm -hmm. between us, Nick, what I'm finding is there's no one that stands singularly behind this. Right. No one. That's a professional scholar that's given a uh, that gets paid for what they do and spend a, a number of years of their life engaged in hard hard level research, you know, high end research that is willing to champion this singularly. And there are plenty of other scholars that will champion a, a sort of singular or at least a primary primary approach to a skeptical sort of uh, assessment of the Gospels. You know, you think of somebody like uh, John Dominic Crossan and uh, his, his cynic thesis. You don't have anyone that is willing to stand behind this singularly. The closest you're going to get is Robert Price. In other words, this is such a weak scholarly position at, at, at that level, rather than just a popular level, that people, if they use this critique of the Gospels, they append it to their, to their overall polemic against the Gospels. They mm -hmm. kind of add it in as kind of a lot, like, oh, and by
by the way, uh, there's a lot of pagan myths that look a lot like Jesus just saying. No yeah. one is willing to stand behind this and say, I'm ready to take all comers. Bring it. Yeah. You know, In so, fact, uh, I was even saying that we could say Bart Ehrman even has strong words against these people. Oh, gosh, yes. Big time. If you read Ehrman's, uh, Ehrman's not his last book, but his book before last. Did Jesus Exist? Exactly. Did Jesus Exist? You'll find a, a where he'll say, he says, look, yeah. there are two people that I have to take seriously that believe some mild version of this would be Richard Terry on the lighter version and a little heavier version in, in Robert Price. And you have to at least take their ideas somewhat seriously, though they're floating against the stream. And he disagrees with their idea that Jesus was likely a mythological construct that didn't exist at all. Mm. So, uh, so you have a number of people warning you, watch out. Yep. Go another way. If you're going to critique the Gospels, there's better ways to go. And, and I'll tell you, in my PhD research, which has been, which has been quite heavy and 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 rigorous, uh, doesn't make make me right automatically. Obviously, I mean, I disagree with a number of people that that hold doctorates as well. But but the idea here is, I, I've been searching high and low and doing my best to make these arguments stronger than they're actually presented, so that I have an authentic opponent to interact with in my <laughs> dissertation. Uh, paper and then my my defense before uh, the committee. Yeah, well, let's go into some of these. For okay. instance, with Akira S, I've got her website right here, okay. the truthbeknown.com, and this is what she says about Mithra. Yeah. Mithra was born on December 25th of a virgin Anahita. The babe was wrapped in swaddling clothes, placed in a manger, and attended by shepherds. He was considered a great traveling teacher and master. He had 12 companions or disciples. He performed miracles. As the great bull of a son, Mithra sacrificed himself for world peace. He ascended to heaven. Mithra was viewed as a good shepherd, the way, the truth, and the light, the redeemer, the savior, the messiah. Mithra is omniscient, as he hears all, sees all, knows all, none can deceive him. He was identified with both the lion and the lamb. His sacred day was Sunday, the Lord's day, hundreds of years before the appearance of Christ. His religion had a Eucharist or Lord's Supper. Mithra sets his mark on the foreheads of his soldiers, and Mithraism embraced, emphasized baptism. Well, whew, that sounds quite intimidating right there, <laughs> Joe. But it does, doesn't it? Too yeah. bad it's largely untrue. Uh, here's the idea. This is, again, we already said something to keep in mind is to remember differences make a difference, right? Right. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing, and this may be, if, if, look, if your internet goes down and all you hear is this on this program when it comes to this subject of pagan copycats, Remember this, mm. just because a, a certain figure might be antecedent to the first century, antecedent to Jesus' time on the earth, and then what's, what's said about him and written about him later, doesn't necessarily mean the features that are quoted about this figure mm. are also antecedent. This is extraordinarily important. For example, most of the figures listed in, in Zeitgeist, uh, mm -hmm. or even Mithra, come before Jesus. They're worshipped before Jesus. They have stories about them before Jesus. I'm going to do a little Mithra, uh, a little Mithra uh, deal for you guys here in just a second, because that's one of the chapters in, in my work. But, but the question is, do the features, do the features she's talking about, are they, are they in the early Mithra tradition or in the late Mithra tradition? So, just a little bit of background on Mithra. Mithra was called Mithra with the Persians and even before that, the Indians. Then he's called Mithras when the Romans pick it up and, and largely change it to a mystery cult that only soldiers were, were allowed to be in and were attracted to as a militaristic sort of cult. For years, uh, uh, people thought, well, it's, they, they, most of the features in the Persian and Indian versions of the Mithra story that are pre-Christ were largely carried over into the Roman post, post-Christian uh, Mithra uh, scenarios. Most mm -hmm. of the inscriptions we have about Mithra, uh, from an archaeological standpoint, are dated to about the you know early to mid second century. Uh, and a lot of the features she listed, um, uh, the, the the supper, uh, that's from uh, an account that's in the 200s A.D., well after not only Jesus has been on the scene in Palestine, but that he's already uh, they've already been talking and writing about him as well. The um, uh, the mark on the forehead is from Tertullian, discussing what the uh, what the, the what what part of the ritual was about. But he excoriates and, and critiques Mithraeus in his uh, in his community in the late second century. So you need to, it's very very important to have a parallel a pagan copycat person put their money 
where their mouth is and say, okay, sure, clearly Krishna preceded Jesus. Clearly Buddha preceded Jesus. These are obviously central figures in religious tradition. Or go heroes. The idea of Hercules, the literature about him preceded Jesus. The idea of Mithra preceded Jesus. But that does not necessarily mean that the, the event being described as parallel to the Gospels is also part of that early tradition. Right. And that's the key thing, right? Devil's in the details. What you have to say is, and this is exactly what happened to Zeitgeist and, and on uh, Dolores Murdoch's website, is you take this tradition that's obviously earlier than Christianity, and you take features very, very late after Christianity and assume, because they're in the late version, that they must be in the earlier version. Mm -hmm. And there's really, especially with Mithra, this is double jeopardy, because there's no reason to believe that the two, the two, the religion stayed static as it moved out of Persia and was brought to the Greeks and Romans. There are other religions where you see some features that carry over. This, you don't really see features carrying over. For example, in Roman Mithraism, they say he killed a bull as, as kind of a sacrifice for, for humankind. Um, what you don't have is you don't have the bull-killing scenario going on in the Persian or Indian versions that yep. precede Christianity. And that's where you get a lot of the accolades about him being, uh, you know, this, this person that would affect your salvation. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in the Persian tradition, he's one of, the, one of the high gods in their pantheon of many gods. But you have a number of things that don't make it back into that earlier tradition. And, it's, and scholars would say, whoa, 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 no, 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 you can't read that back. Right. You're not allowed to read that back. And this happens in nearly all the zeitgeist scenarios, too. Most of the characters they list as parallel in zeitgeist. The characters were known and maybe worshipped or at least adored prior to the Christian era. But a lot of the details that are similar come after. So in that sense, you've got to be really, really careful about that. One other, one other qualifier, too. Remember there's a difference, and scholars note this all the time, there's a difference between cultic ritual data and narrative data. Mm -hmm. And most scholars say largely the narrative or mythical data informs the cultic ritual. So, you know, when you just throw these together, you don't, you don't care about time frame. You say, okay, I'm just going to, anything that mentions Mithras, I'm going to pull and just grab it all together and put it in my arms and then throw it out on the table. And if anything matches Jesus, I'll put it up there. Now, notice you're not putting the differences up there so somebody can make an informed and responsible scholarly parallel claim or say, okay, well, there's too many differences to make it there. Second, you're ignoring chronology, which there's not a scholar that makes connections like this with ancient lit that would say you can, you're allowed to ignore chronology. You're just mm -hmm. not allowed to do it. And third, you're assuming what's called the essentialist fallacy, the idea that just because it's in this late tradition, it must be in the former tradition. And we know, especially with Mithra, that's not the case. In fact, it was the first uh, conference where all the Mithra scholars in America came together in 1975, where these scholars basically said, look, we don't agree. The assumption has been up to this point that Persian and Indian Mithraism is largely the same as late Roman myth Mithraism. And we're saying the scholars unanimously said no. Years later, they had another conference. Even more, we're digging up even more data, more archaeology. No, even even stronger consensus saying this is not a connection. So if, if there's a break between the two, you've got to ask yourself, okay, what's going on? As far as the other claims, uh, yeah, if somebody's considered a being worthy of worship, they're going to do some supernatural uh, sort of, uh, the miracle claims, that, you know, it's a wash because anybody that has someone they, they consider to be, you know, a, a figure worthy of their attention, they're going to do super things, special things that can include miracles. So the question isn't so much, was he a miracle worker? What kind of miracles? Um, what, what kind of, uh, you know, what was the context? What was the purpose of the miracles? And this isn't hair splitting. This is exactly what scholars do when they attempt to make matches with other lists in the ancient world. Yeah. And if, if I could be so bold, let me just go one more step here. In my PhD dissertation, they, the, the big thing is method. Method, method, method. Yeah. So how do you determine if something has enough commonality to be called a possible or even legitimate parallel and enough di differentiation or distinction to put it out of the category? Well, Nick, what I did is, I, and I thought this was fair, I took the best and most respected scholars in the field on this subject that do this for a living in a scholarly way, and everybody seems to think, okay, we may not agree with everything that these guys put out there, but you know what? These guys are, they're doing it right. They're doing it right. And I culled my criteria for whether something was a match from guys that aren't believers that do this sort of thing uh, all the time. So, for example, 
when you when you look at in the ancient world at people that are trying to say I don't know compare like Persian literary uh, um, themes and motifs and even actual data to say Roman or Greek, uh, what you find is uh, you you find that these guys are 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 being very very careful. They're getting into the details. They're so careful because but they don't want to make a wrong parallel claim by just sort of spewing out this thing and being, and being playing loose and fast with the details. So, uh, for example, uh, you have a guy, Walter Berger, right? Mm -hmm. Walter Berger, professor emeritus of classics at the University of Zurich. This guy has spent, uh, amongst other books he's, he's, he's author, he spent years of his life attempting to link the features of Homer and Gilgamesh together. And one of his criteria is, look, one of the things that should alert you, there needs to be numerous similarities that reveal what's called a complex structure, Nick, a complex structure. And that means they, they can't just be just numerous. They also have to build on one another and mean largely the same thing. And where you, you can't really pass this off, well, that's one of, the, one of the features of my method. Well, there has to be numerous, one, complex structures. You have another guy, uh, Martin Litchfield West, Oxford professor of classics, antiquities, and philology. He says, well, not only do you have to have numerous, you have to have really, really, really strong connections. I Meaning not vague connections, oh, they did miracles. No, you need to ask what kind of miracles, what was the purpose of them, what did the audience perceive, what, were the, what, was, the, what was the general, uh, the general thrust of the, of the miracle attempt, and, and where was it done, and how was it done? Um, you take somebody like Jan Pruvel, Jan Pruvel, he, uh, John Hopkins University, he was uh, educated at Harvard University, and he's the professor of comparative mythology there. He's tried to link numerous ancient documents together, and he says, well, not only do you have to have it be numerous, but the meaning needs to be very, very tightly connected. So when you have somebody say something like, well, didn't they have a meal? They had a sacrificial meal? That's not detailed enough for the professional. Yeah. It's not. For someone to have a meal where they talk about Mithras, it doesn't serve the same function as the Last Supper. It doesn't serve the same function in the post-Jesus community when they do the Last Supper to commemorate his sacrifice. It doesn't have the same function. It just doesn't. The whole, the whole meaning of the word resurrection or salvation doesn't have the same function either. Um, yeah. uh, the last guy who contributes to our method is a guy named Charles Penglaze. He's author of a book, Greek Myths, uh, Parallels and Influence in Homeric Hymns and Hesiod. So he's trying to connect this ancient data. And his thing is, look, if the big thing is chronology. You can't have something influence another if the chronology is off. And we know this. This is common sense stuff. But yeah. I put all these gentlemen together who I believe, I don't know if any of them are, are, are friends of Christianity. And I say, okay, here's my method. We're going to look at these original sources because that's what somebody uh, uh, like uh, uh, Bruce Metzger, you know, Airman's mentor, said to do. It's something that, uh, you know, somebody like uh, Ron Nash in Gospel of the Greeks, he says to do this sort of thing, look at the original sources. But then what do you do after that? We have to have a method to compare them between the Gospels and see whether you've got a match or not. And so I take these guys' criteria and I put them into my own method. And that's, we've run them through that sort of thing. And you need to know, Mithras is, is, a, is a particularly difficult one for them to highlight. Um, now, the good part is you have a lot of information in a lot of different cultures that are, that are at odds or even contradictory to one another that you can pull from and kind of lay these features down and ignore all the other ones. That's already, you're already on the wrong foot if you're not showing all the context and all the differences along with the similarities. You can do that so somebody can make a, a plausible claim. But second, there's no death in Mithras. <laughs> So there's yeah. no resurrection. I noticed in the list, uh, at least, the, the, and Kyrie S. is careful enough on our website not to put that he was crucified, So I think Peter Joseph does in, uh, in, in Zeitgeist, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong there. But, but, but no crucifixion, no resurrection. The central event in Christianity, you don't have that. If there's no death of Mithras or Mithra, you have him being assumed into heaven, yeah. then, you know, there's, there's no resurrection. And that's another thing I center on, too. I can't possibly do all the motifs, though I... I interact with some of these other ideas in my PhD dissertation. I just go after death and resurrection. And I think it's important to say, look, we need to at least say they died in order to have anything like a resurrection, right? I mean, you've got to at least say death precedes it. So, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the things I run through the rubric is, well, what's the, what's the chronology? What's the competition? What are the similarities? What are the number and the strength of the similarities? And what's the centrality of the death account and the return account or resurrection account? Because, you know, Resurrection laden with all sorts of meanings and, and or all sorts of meaning in the Jewish community. You know this. Yeah. So, um, 
So yeah, that, with Mithras, you're in a really bad way because the, the vast majority of the claims about Mithras are post-Christian. Mm. And the minute you start looking at these very closely, you find, for example, the one I gave you about the, 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 the meal and the, the mark on the forehead are both Tertullian. That's late second century. Yeah. So, I, you know, that's, but you're, it's assumed when it's presented to you on the website or in Peter Joseph's mockumentary or even in, on, on other websites, it's presented to you like, well, look, Mithra was known and spoken about and worshipped before Jesus, and they say all this about him. So it'll do no good. It's, it's irresponsible to the point of, I don't want to be, I don't want to make a moral point. It's irresponsible to the point of almost being deceptive to not list all the differences, not note the chronology. And then to uh, to literally go against the scholarly consensus. Let me just give you this: you can, Walter Booker has written about Mithras. Manfred Klaus has written about Mithras. Uh, Gary Lees. These are not friends of Christianity. All of them say there's no match here. All of them. Not only do they say there's a break, a significant break between Roman Mithraism and Greek Mithraism and the idea of of Persian and Indian Mithraism, but all of these men, Booker, Klaus, Lees, these are recognized authorities that aren't friends of ours in the field. Say. There's not a match here. This is not a precursor to Christianity. Yeah, and not. one of my favorite yeah. ones in this section also is that uh, my wife asked me about this one because she knows my stance on this, but she wanted to check some things. And then said, what is it that you said about Mithras not being really born of a virgin? I said, well, technically you could say Mithras was born of a virgin. Quite likely that rock never had sex. <laughs> and in fact, even on her webpage later on here where she talked about all the similarities of Mithras, uh, Acra Leo goes on has such of Mithra the Rockborn. Yeah, yeah. They, so she'll admit it. So yeah. I guess if we're talking about Mother Earth, is the only way you can get a virgin out of that. Yeah, they do this all this stuff. You know the whole. Uh, you know, hey, he's his. Uh, he was worshipped in caves. You know, and some of his things were underground. Some of the worship uh, uh, the, the the worship areas that we've excavated in archaeology were. You know, again, they don't mind the date, late second century. Uh, when this, this the cult started to flourish and it became a mystery cult. That's another thing they don't know, that mystery cults were known for secrecy, not public. They weren't public religion. Yeah. Um, they, you know, they, they closed out certain people, so you're not going to get a lot of information there either. Mm. But they used this sort of, this very, again, remember, very vague, devil's in the details, very vague. Like they said, well, Jesus, some of the church fathers said Jesus might have been born in a cave instead of just a shelter outside of the inn. You know, it's Catalama, the Greek word is what's in play. And, and there's no, you know, you don't get that in the Gospels, you know. But even if you go with those sort of things, I mean, you know, they're, they're, I haven't found any information that he's born on December 25th, yeah. and it doesn't matter because it doesn't say Jesus was born on December 25th. That's a red herring anyway. So what you try to do, and what you find here, Nick, is the interesting thing is if the people that are prone to believing this sort of thing think they've made their case by throwing up a lot of vague similarities and saying, see, now, if, if you're trying to do responsible scholarly work or even make a responsible parallel in your own life, you don't just throw a bunch of... Hey, remember the ear scenario. You've got ears. A kangaroo's got ears. You're not a kangaroo. So you've got to distribute those differentiations to make a to make a, a legitimate and scholarly parallel. And you just don't have it in Mithras. Uh, when, when the when the heads in the field that write about Mithras and are familiar with the broad range of of lit about him in all three communities, Indian, Persian, and Greco-Roman, say are all saying this is not a precursor of Christianity. This is not, this is not, this is not. Yeah. Then you've got to kind of start wondering where Ankyrie is coming from. What special insight does she possess that these scholars don't, that don't, that don't share our belief system? So, and, and I think that's something interesting. Yeah. And even if you go to people within our system, you know, I, 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 I think it would be unfair not to mention Edwin Yamuchi. You know Edwin Yamuchi. Oh, right? yeah. University of Dayton. Uh, he's a, a strong believer, uh, it, this, uh, very, but, but a very well-known and respected Asian scholar of, of the ancient world. And he's like, there's nothing here. He was at the conferences on Mithraism, was invited uh, on Mithras in the 70s, the, the mid-late 70s, and he's always maintained the stance. Regardless of my Christianity, there's not a match here. Yeah, so. I'm also looking at her site, and one thing I wanted to check here was, does she mention David Ulensi? And yeah. she yeah. doesn't, and yeah. most of the people I've read who want to argue for Mithraism, they've never even heard of Ulensi. And then I look in bibliography, and what do I see with several sources? Wikipedia, Wikipedia, Wikipedia. I'm telling you, and there's a reason to be to be a. There's a look. I mean, at the end of the day, Wikipedia is a. I, I want to say what a what a grand and ambitious project. But come on, there's a reason why at university you're not allowed to you're not allowed to footnote it. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why because look, let's be honest. It's it's it, 
the gatekeepers aren't themselves vetted, and they get things wrong. What is, I, I, I'll never forget the quote from Craig Blomberg on this, on Wikipedia. He's like, look, the worst part about Wikipedia is that uh, not, not so much that it had me completely wrong in its entry, that uh, other people entered information about me that was completely erroneous, but that I was able to go in and change it without anybody checking with me. Yeah. He said, now that, that's the real kicker right there. So, mm. so yeah, when you get these Wikipedia, so I think Wikipedia is good in a, in a real, real, real basic sort of scenario. Uh, maybe birth and death, sometimes they get that right. So Pop culture. Yeah, salient contours of someone's life or work, but beyond that, it, it, it's rather suspect because it's a constantly changing. It's mm. like an encyclopedia for this day and age, a relativistic day and age. Yeah. You're going to be much better off going to an older dictionary, even though it's not it's not as easily accessible or free online, you know, a Britannica or an Oxford or something underwritten by a university because they're going to have scholars that at least will say, all right, look, I've been vetted, you can test me on this, that have entered these subjects. Yeah, I often refer to Wikipedia as the abomination that causes misinformation. Indeed, it really does. And, mm. and it, 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 it's part of that global phenomenon of walking around with these personalized distraction devices, not that I'm against, hey, I've got, a, I've got an iPhone, yeah. but, and, and having this portable brain from the hive mind with you where you just largely don't question it. Just like prior to internet, everybody thought if it was on TV, it must be true. Yeah, and yeah. unfortunately to me about internet atheists, read yeah. this stuff about Mithra and everyone else, I, oh, must be true. Absolutely. And it, it seems to be the mindset that if it argues against Christianity, it's true. It's crazy, isn't it, Nick? Yes. I, I, you find that they turn off the critical faculties, mm -hmm. right, when this sort of thing happens. And yep. You know, at least you can say for guys like us, you know, I, yes, we have a bias, but so does everyone, so guess what, we're all in the same boat. But, yeah. but at the end of the day, we're going to try to subject our claim to truth, because we have a, 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 a leader, a God, and a God-man that told us truth is the most important thing in the world. And so we also believe that truth Whenever we get truth in any other area, it stands up to criticism, it stands up to scrutiny. So we're going to subject it to that. Mm -hmm. You just wish, especially these internet ages, would subject their own presuppositions and some of their own ideas to the same level of scrutiny you see. I mean, for example, is there an ancient document that's more scrutinized than the New Testament or the Bible? I'm not sure you could say with any confidence that there's another ancient document that is more scrutinized than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the historians and, and uh, 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 antiquity scholars all over the place have said what we, if we scrutinize Herodotus, Pausanias, uh, Strabo, uh, uh, Thucydides, uh, uh, you know, any of these guys, uh, Pliny, um, Suetonius, Suetonius uh, uh, Tacitus, to the, to the same level of scrutiny you do the Gospels, I mean, we wouldn't have anything left. You know, so, so I, you just wish you'd get a little parody, right? A little, yeah. all right, if I'm going to do this, you do it with your presuppositions as well. Mm. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, you just don't get that, really, mm. yeah. especially when it comes to this subject. Mm. Uh, I, I think you need to be really, really careful when the critics that dislike and are actively animated mm. by dislike of Christianity, or even just don't have a care for Christianity, or just straight scholars in the area that will identify this if they see it in front of them. When they're saying, be careful, don't do this, you've got to, real, you, you, you've got to be really careful to not outrun what, what people who have been studying this are saying. Well, we're about halfway for our show right now, so we're going to take a quick break here. Oh, My guest is Joe Marvel here. We're talking about pagan copycats. I'm Nick Peters. This is the Deeper Waters Podcast, and we'll be back after this break. It's here, the official Brock Radio mobile app. Listen to your favorite Brock Radio programs on your iPhone, iPad, iPod, Kindle Fire, Android smartphones, and tablets. The best thing is, it's absolutely free. Download it now from the iTunes or Google Play App Store. Or get a link at our website, cyiworldwide.com. Rock Radio. Christian radio that doesn't suck. Check out cyiworldwide.com. Home of Rock Radio. Free music downloads, advice, prayer, and support. cyiworldwide.com. Do you rock? Hey, this is Minister Grok. Thanks for listening. Although Grok Radio is free, there are costs to upkeep the website, podcast, and purchase Bibles and materials for street ministry. And while we are happy to pay this ourselves out of pocket, we will gladly accept any gifts if you feel led to support the shows and our street ministry. You can send a gift or love offering through our website at cyiworldwide.com. 
www.thewildwildwest.com. Thanks for your support, and God bless. Check out CYIWorldwide.com. CYIWorldwide.com. Home of Grok Radio. Free music downloads, advice, prayer, and support. CYIWorldwide.com. Do you grok? Can't get enough of your favorite Grok Radio shows? Well, now you can download episodes for free. Check out the Grok Radio program archive at CYIWorldwide.com. And we're back to our show. We've got Joe Marva here. Here We're talking about pegging copycat theory. But if you're here next week, we're going to be talking about the canon of Scripture. How did we get the Old Testament? How did we get the New Testament? My guest is going to be Lee McDonald to talk about that. One of the leading scholars on the study of the biblical canon. It's going to be a great show. If you want to know how you got your Old Testament, how you got your New Testament, you're going to need to be listening to this show. For now, we're getting back with Joe Marvel here talking about pagan copycats. And we just got done talking about Mithra, and we could have probably spent a whole show talking about Mithra alone. But we're going to go on ahead and talk about Horus. And he's also usually connected with Osiris as well. And I believe he's also talked about by Bill Maher and Religulus. But let's get the uh, facts, and I say a quotation mark here, about Horus. Horus was born of a virgin Isis Mary on December 25th in a cave manger with his birth being announced by a star in the east and a ten by three wise men. And I should point out, this is all coming from Akira's website. Yeah. His earthly father was named Seb, Joseph. Seb is also known as Geb. As Horus the Elder, he was believed to be the son of Geb and Nut. And that's from Lewis Finn's Ancient Egyptian Myths and Legends, page 84. He was of royal descent. At age 12, he was a child teacher in the temple, and at 30, he was baptized, having disappeared for 18 years. He was bap- Horus was baptized in the river Eridanus, or Erutana, Jordan, by Anup the Baptizer, John the Baptist, who was decapitated. He had 12 followers and or fellow gods, two of whom were his witnesses, and were named Anup and On, the two Johns. He performed miracles, exorcised demons, and raised El Lazarus, El Osiris, from the dead. The Egyptian god walked on water. His personal epithet was Ayusa, the ever the ever becoming son of Ptah, the father. He was thus called Holy Child. He was transfigured on the mount. The Egyptian god Osiris was killed, buried for three days in the tomb, and resurrected. Horus, Osiris, and Ra were called the Way of the Truth for Light, Messiah. God's annoyed son, the son of man, the good shepherd, the lamb of God, the word made flesh, the word of truth, etc. The Egyptian god was a father and was associated with a fish, Ichthus, lamb and lion. He came to fulfill the law. The Egyptian god Osiris was called the cursed Christ or anointed one. It's K-R-S-T. And like Jesus, Horus was supposed to reign 1,000 years. Dang, Joe, that is all so impressive. We are just about pack it in right now, right? Oh, if only most of it were true. Uh, yeah, it's so hard to keep up. There's so many things there uh, that, you, you know, you want to go, wow, again, you, you lay these down mm-hmm. as uh, truth. Now, notice, uh, is, there, is there any documentation beside any of these similarities? That's the first thing. Well, one of them has a Lewis Spence with ancient Egyptian myths and legends. Yeah, which one is that connected to, you know? His earthly father was named Seb, Joseph, and Seb is also known as Geb, as Horus V. Herald, or he was believed to be the son of Geb, Geb and Nut. Yeah. Um, here's the problem. Just, we'll just start with that one. We'll start with that one. Okay. Here's the problem. Horus was a, a big, big deal, right? Son mm-hmm. of Osiris. Interestingly, people used to use the Osiris uh, parallel, but now that every, that's kind of passe in a scholarly mm-hmm. world. Nobody's using him anymore because, it, it, you know, it, here's why. Horus was merged with a number of different gods. And, you know, this is the problem. And not only are we working with a language, hieroglyphics, that we just, you know, relatively recently have learned to translate, you know, the... Uh, uh, Rosetta Stone. Yeah, the Rosetta Stone. And, the, and, that, so, and you're dealing with a, a massive, massive amount of data. Most of the time, contradictory, competitive data about Horus. He said he's, uh, you know, uh, the son of Hathor at one point, and then he's merged with Ra, and then he's the son of Osiris and Isis. Mm-hmm. And then, so the strongest tradition has him the son of Osiris and Isis. 
Uh, this can be transliterated when it moves from the Egyptian community to worship in another, a, a Greek community, a Roman community. It can be moved over to the, 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 to the name Set in some traditions. In others, it's not. It remains Osiris. It remains Hathor. In some uh, versions, he's, uh, he's connected to Thoth, the god of the underworld as well, before Osiris becomes you know, the leader of the underworld. So the first thing to realize is we're dealing with a tradition that is a, it, it is, there's a lot of information that's been dug up, and it's very, very difficult to interpret. One, just from a linguistic standpoint, symbol-based interpretive standpoint. Second, we're dealing with a mass of data, and it will do no good to say, all right, I'm going to cherry pick over here and over here and over here. The third, the worst problem, the third sense, the worst problem there is, is some of it's just, just not in the data at all. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of the quickest way to do this. Maybe I'll just quote, years ago when your father-in-law, Mike Lacona, was investigating these claims when he encountered it in a video form prior to, prior to the zeitgeist phenomenon, when he, uh, when he encountered it in uh, 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 the, the, the God Who Wasn't There, uh, yeah. that video series, or video that was uh, produced uh, and, and Brian uh, Fleming. propagated on the Internet. He uh, got in touch with um, uh, a doctor named Bryant. I don't know if you've ever read uh, Mike's uh, oh, interaction yeah. with this gentleman. It's a Rutgers University specialist in, in, uh, in Indian studies. Mm. Um, and, and he said, well, all right, what, what about Krishna? What are we going to do here? What, what, is, this, is, is the Krishna connection there? Now, this wasn't Horace, it was Krishna. And they were, they were actively upset about anyone spreading misinformation like this. Then he did the same thing when it came to Buddha. He got uh, a hold of the, the chair of the uh, Department of Comparative Studies and uh, a Buddha scholar there at Rutgers. Yep. This woman, same thing. I can't believe someone's saying this sort of thing. So what do we have here with Horace? You have a, a, an Egyptologist that say no. For example, there's an Egyptologist named Dr. S.G.F. Brandon in my, in, in my PhD studies that says, listen, when you go through these things, borrowing by Christianity cannot be substantiated by the evidence. And even if it had some evidence of some connection here and there, you're pulling from such a large battery of conflicting data that you're going to be able to find a connection between Horace and Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. So, it, 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 and, and he finishes up by saying it's also intrinsically most improbable. Brandon says this. Why does he say this? The reason Brandon says this is because clearly the Jewish culture doesn't seem prone to assimilation in a religious sense or synchronicity in a, in, a, in a religious sense. So mm -hmm. um, when it comes to uh, being crucified, there's absolutely, I can say with confidence, because when it comes to death and resurrection, that's the center of my research, my PhD study, right? The mm -hmm. other things, the 12 followers, that's based on an art, art, art interpretation, which is already suspect, right? Where you yeah. have a, 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 an artwork depiction of Horus after he comes to defeat Seth and avenge his father Osiris' dismemberment death, at the hands of his rival, and now he's ruling uh, Egypt, and then later pharaohs get named, it gets incorporated, they incorporate mm -hmm. Horus's name into the pharaoh's title, so you got this merging of deity and, and personhood in the Egyptian uh, pantheon. So you have this sort of, in, in the Egyptian tradition, well, when, when you push that sort of thing and say, well, look, uh, you have Horus going, you don't have any death by crucifixion, or death by way of uh, by anything that's remotely close to what you have in the gospel accounts. The key, if you're looking at, let's just go to the key data. What about the 12 disciples? That's based on an artistic interpretation of the 12 signs of the zodiac around Horus in a rather late artist rendition of, of what scholars believe is a, an impression of Horus in, in, uh, in, in ancient art. But again, artistic interpretation, interpreting a song or interpreting artwork is highly, highly suspicious for a variety of reasons scholars. Um, but when it comes to the death, we'll stick right there for a second, that's my area. There are accounts that talk about a possible death for Horus. We're going to talk about those in just a second. Um, but that still does not move scholars to say that this is a, a crucifixion, it's a death and resurrection, it looks anything like Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's clearly no real resurrection, though you can maybe make a claim of a return. Let me give you the two accounts so that, that you can be familiar with these key, these key uh, events. There's a Stella that was unearthed years ago. That's a, a, a large stone that was cut, and then they put hieroglyphics and artwork on the stone. It's dated to the 4th century B.C. It was found by a, an archaeologist named Metternich, and so it's called the Metternich Stella. On that Stella is an account of Isis, the mom, 
wife of the late Osiris, killed by the rival of Osiris, and Isis and Horus named Set, or Seth, depending on how you're pronouncing it, the English transliteration. So in, on the Stella, there's an account of the infant Horus, right? The infant Horus being attacked by scorpions at the instigation of Seth. And scholars are split over whether he dies in the, data, in the, in the hieroglyphic interpretation here. He's stunned, he's unconscious, he could, it could be death, but regardless, there's some scholars that say this 4th century Stella indicates a death for Horus. Now that's a long way from crucifixion, but you have people stretching that, right? Mm-hmm. Taking that vague thing going, well, scorpions sting, and Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. Now this is where, mm-hmm. yeah, scholars roll their eyes on purpose. Mm-hmm. Now, so clearly, uh, so yeah, basically he's gone, he's either unconscious or dead, Isis gets a hold of her buddy Thoth, who's the, the kind of the guy in charge of the underworld at this time, uh, or at least co-regent of the underworld, and Thoth revives her son, either brings him back from a stunned state or an unconscious state or a death state. Now, that's hardly anywhere close to the gospel accounts, even mm-hmm. though it does, it is part of a tradition that precedes Christianity. Um, the only other one is one from a first century BC, and this is right before the first century AD, right? Yeah. Uh, writer named Theodorus Siculus. He wrote a, a, a work called History. And in this work, Theodorus is, is merging a lot of antecedent deities with Greek deities or Roman deities. And he's mm-hmm. merging them together, like they did with Serapis, right? They, they took aspects of Greek deity and aspects of Egyptian deity and merged them together uh, intentionally. So, and they did the same sort of thing. So he's writing about this, but notice this isn't narrative data. He's not writing about what happened to Horus, but he's, he writes about uh, people in the town that I'm traveling in say this of Horus. So in the first century BC, if we're going to, if we're just not going to, we're not going to critically investigate the, the extent, you know, remains like we do the gospel and just assume, okay, if he lived in this time period, maybe he wrote this time period, it's at least possible. Mm-hmm. We'll get the best possible argument here. Yeah. He says there are people in this town that say of Horus, that he was torn to pieces by titans, listen closely, boiled, and then revived by a, a, a chief god above him. Now, there's not a scholar, an Egyptian scholar, that takes this seriously. Mm-hmm. But here's why. Not only is Theodorus merging deities illegitimately here and there, and just trying to merge these two traditions, and it's not, it's not, he's not really trying to remain accurate or scholarly in, the, in a lot of ways, but the second big thing is this is a story connected to Dionysus. Mm-hmm. So... There, there is absolutely no story of, of, of Horus being dismembered, being boiled by rivals, and then reconstituted. That is a Dionysus story that we can get to a little later if you like. But that's, that's uh, the Dionysus, what they call the Zagreus Dionysus story. But again, when it comes to the crucial death and resurrection, you just don't have it there. And you also have scholars in the field saying, no, this is not a match. Yeah. I'm sorry it isn't. Uh, 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 with, yeah, with Osiris, though, don't we have an account that his body was supposedly split into pieces and Isis went around and gathered all the pieces? Yes, uh, and she couldn't find the, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the main member, <laughs> the central member. So, that's it. anyway, that's funny. Sounds a lot like the Jesus story, right? No. Yeah, mm-hmm. with the Osiris story, real quick, the reason it's largely been abandoned is because even critical scholars uh, that aren't exactly given to Christianity... Uh, Gosh, I'm blanking. I had two names that came before me, but I'm blanking. But, but, but even they say, look, he's not really resurrected, Osiris. He's brought back to life to rule the underworld when his wife puts the, the body parts back together again. Yeah. She said, you know, I, I think your buddy J.P. Holy called him the Lego God, right? This sort right. of, you know, but the reconstitution. But he, he never comes in the land of the living except for to, you know, uh, as a shade or an insubstantial soul of some sort to to smell the incense burned to him, and then he goes right back to ruling the underworld. Yep. You have a mummy god, a god of the dead, that, again, is a far cry from the Jesus tradition. That's why he's largely been abandoned. And I want to be honest with you, I think when you look at this stuff, and this is not just me, but Egyptologists are, are speculating, yeah. that the reason that, that Zeitgeist had Horus as their star, and people have moved from Osiris to Horus, is because there's so much data on Horus. Yeah. You, can, you can pull something from everywhere on this, and most of it's conflicting. I mean, you have Horus's name connected to actual pharaohs that we have historic information on. You have Horus's name connected to a, you know, a Dionysus tale here in a first century uh, Greek writer, Theodorus Siculus. You have uh, Horus uh, being referenced in very, very old uh, hieroglyphics and on temples. But what you don't have 
is significant, complex, and and uh, unique parallels, either linguistically, event, or language going on that would give you a connection. And that's why I think you don't have the original source sources there for every one of these claims. Because the minute, again, like, like Metzger said and like Nash said, the minute you go and look at the original source documentation, this thing begins and continues to fall apart. Because again, then you're, then all the differences are put in front of you. And you really start to, give me an example. Um, one of the favorites of Carrier is a guy named Zalmoxis. Mm-hmm. He doesn't say, the, again, he's not saying the account, uh, and that's Herodotus, right? 5th to 4th yeah. century BC. Um, or maybe 6th to 5th. I mm-hmm. think I think it's fifth to fourth. Anyway, Herodotus is clearly antecedent to Jesus, so or the Jesus account. Um, in the Zalmoxis tale, you know, Carrier's careful. He doesn't say obviously that Matthew or, or, or Mark or Luke or John had to have the Zalmoxis tale open beside them at the editing table. But he does say, well, this is the only account I know of a substantial dying and rising God. But when you read the account, yeah, he doesn't die. Right. Uh, he just Zalmoxis disappears. Just goes and hides. You know, this Zalmoxis goes and hides in a cave and fools people into rising. So the only way you have a real parallel here is if you believe one of the one of the the least plausible alternatives to the resurrection, and that is right the assumed death or the swoon theory, which has been it's like believing in a flat earth theory in Jesus studies. It's, it's been largely abandoned. So even even one of Carrier's favorite, very careful possibilities turns out upon inspection to be really rather disappointing to be quite honest. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you also mentioned J.P. Holding, because yeah. since we can't go into everything, what do you yeah. think about his resources at tectonics.org on the Pagan Copycat feed? Would you recommend people go there? I will. Uh, let me put it this way. Uh, between him and Glenn Miller, this is where I began my investigation. And I, I'll tell you this. Besides, uh, mm-hmm. besides very superficial errors, and I'm talking spelling errors or you know, calling uh, Mercia Iliade a woman, and that's a fair thing, because if you don't know it's a male scholar, you're, yeah. you're going to find a lot of good information there, a lot of good information. And, and another thing that's really impressive about JP is if he's called out, he's going to he's going to engage with the critique of what mm-hmm. he's doing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know, a, a, a master's in library studies really, really orients you or situates or disposes you to go to original source documentation, and JP goes out of his way to do that. So I would suggest that as a... A, a wonderful first step, and if nothing else, just to kind of, kind of get some information so you can kind of at least add something, yeah. add something back when somebody offers you. So you can say, okay, if nothing else from this broadcast, you can say, okay, are there any differences? Where, where, where in the chronology does this fall, and what's the original source documentation? Mm-hmm. Now, if somebody can't offer you that, then they're just they're speaking out of ignorance on this. Or even just even if you don't want to do that, and you just want to say this. Do the majority of scholars that are vetted and professional in the field believe this thesis from the idea that there was a, even a motif or an archetype of a dying and rising anything, God, deity back then, before Jesus, all the way to the specifics of somebody like a Mithras or a Horus or a Dionysus being a clear narrative precursor, a, a source from which they borrowed and just kind of cut and paste. Yeah. Um, and you're not gonna, you're just not gonna be able to produce. Yeah, I, I can say there was a time I saw JP saying something about Aristotle, for instance, and I mess emailed him and said, uh, JP, uh, that's actually not accurate for what Aristotle said. And he said, Well, can you find me the original source? Can you find me some documentation? So yeah. I went, got the documentation, sent it to him. Everything's corrected then. There you go, and that's great too. Mm-hmm. Now, because I mean, you know, again, I think we have a little more, and I'm not saying we're more moral. That'd be foolish, but I am saying you have a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know, impetus to try to be honest and not mislead when you're following Christ. So, I, you know, I, I do appreciate that about it. But I've, I've found a lot of really good information on, on, on JP's site. That's a great place to, to at least start your investigation if you want to really look at this. Okay, well, we're at the point of the show, but I'd like to remind everyone that everything we do here, it's really supported by your donations and your support. And frankly, we need them because you know, what we do, it costs things. I work with CYI here, and CYI gives out Bibles, offers prayer, pays for these shows to be able to go on, have a spot that we can advertise them on the web, and CYI needs your donations for that, CYIWorldwide.com, but I can also tell you the work that I do with them, volunteer, I don't get paid a single penny for any of this, and 
My research also needs your support, as does the Ministry of Deeper Waters. So if you can go to deeperwaters.wordpress.com, there's a few things you can do there. You can click on the Donate button, and that will take you to the Ministry of Risen Jesus, Mike Lacona, my father and I have talked about. And they collect donations for us. So you just send in your donation that way. And then it's very important. You need to email them and say, hey, I sent in this donation. I want to go to Nick Peters. I want to go to Deeper Waters. It will be tax deductible. I'll make sure that I get it then. If you don't do that step, they won't know it's for me, and I won't get it. Also, you can go and buy some of the literature online. J.P. Holding and I have recently written together, for instance, Defining an Inerrancy, a response to Norman Geisler and his cohorts on the inerrancy debate. And if you check on my blog page at deeperwaters.wordpress.com, there is an Amazon store there that I uh, advertise books that are talked about on the show and some of my own books and generally others that I recommend for Christian apologetics. And if you go and buy those books, and hey, if you're planning on buying them anyway, the price isn't going to go up. Just go buy them there, and we get a small proceed of what you buy that way. So why not do it that way? Now, Joe, do you have any organization that you want people to support? <laughs> I, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, the reason I'm laughing is you'll love this, Nick. I, and I don't want to waste our valuable minutes here, but I, I, um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Bill Greenlighted me to be uh, uh, live streamed to, I think, I think he reaches, I don't know, I want to say 20 countries or something, uh, on the Defenders Now video, the HD video cast. And at the end of that, I, we had some really, really positive response. You know, hey, man, it was great. Uh, and they, <laughs> the tech guys came to me and said, uh, so, yeah, you have a blog site? I said, uh, no. Hmm. You have a website? I no, no. You have a Facebook? Uh, no. Do you, what do you got? I, I, I got an email. But let me do this. Let me go this way. I would, I would second your notion. I, you know, I know. You, look, Nick's got his father-in-law, right? You know, but I'll tell you this. Mike, Mike's a legit scholar. He puts his ideas to the test and puts them out in the arena to be tested all the time at both Society of Biblical Literature as well as in front of skeptics that come to exactly opposite, the exact opposite conclusion, mm -hmm. as well as are uh, willing to debate publicly on these things. Uh, so, yeah, Risen Jesus is a great site. Uh, reasonablefaith.org, uh, or is it .com? I think it's .org. It's a fantastic site where you know uh, you can get a lot of free resources there too. Um, so I, you know, I don't, I don't have any, uh, you know, tax deductible ministry. I haven't gotten that far in this process. I'm too busy working on teaching, working, and speaking. I probably should get there, but uh, yeah, I, I would suggest those sites uh, for places where you can see resources and, mm -hmm. and dig into them. And, and if I could, uh, I don't know, would you underwrite Apologetics 315? Um, what, 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 what do you have in mind exactly? What is that? I, I would just say it's a great place. Uh, this is an Ireland-based uh, website. Uh, yeah, the ministry of Brian Alton. Yes. There you go. I, I, I really support I, I it. I say something positive about that. I mean, sure. the, even just the links there are fantastic to, mm -hmm. to get to other sites. But this guy, just like, just like Nick's trying to do here, trying to get the word out because, you know, they're, they're made, they're, the, the word may be, some scholars may be locked out of mainstream media for a variety of reasons trying to get the word out, and, and just putting together, you know, the best scholars that they can find in these fields to discuss these subjects, and yeah, Apologetics 315 is fantastic as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's get back into the pagan copycat theory, and one that okay. you mentioned just now, I'm going to go to Acra's website again, and that's Dionysus. Right. So let's see what she says, um, and I remember when I first encountered this, I was a bit surprised, because I read Greek mythology a lot when I was a kid. Sure. I never encountered anything like this. Yeah. So, yeah. here it is. Yeah. Dionysus was born of a virgin on December 25th of the winter solstice. He is the son of a heavenly father as a holy child Bacchus was placed in a cradle crib manger among beasts. He was a traveling teacher who performed miracles. He was a god of a vine and turned water into wine. Now that one, I, I do think that one did take place. Dionysus rode in a triumphal possession on a donkey. He was a sacred king, cured and eaten in a Eucharistic ritual for fecundity and purification. He traveled into the underworld to rescue his loved one, arising from the land of the dead after three days. He rose from the dead on March 25th and ascended to heaven. Bacchus was deemed father, liberator, and savior. Dionysus was considered the only begotten son. King of kings, God of gods, sin-bearer, redeemer, anointed one, and the Alpha and Omega. 
he is identified as a ram or lamb, and his sacrificial title of dendrites or young man of a tree indicates he was hung on a tree or crucified. Well, there you go, Joe. I mean, by God, it's time we just once again surrender and realize Jesus is just a myth copied from Dionysus. <laughs> I, I swear, this is, I, you know, I don't know how many times we go around on this thing, but, but all right. Let's, uh, let, let, gosh, where to start? Um, the names, there doesn't seem to be any evidence of the names there. But I want, let me just say this, though. This is kind of interesting. You might, or you might find this interesting. If you go to, um, there's uh, two scholars named Platzner and Harris mm -hmm. that have a book called Classical Mythology. They have a letterbox portion where they do something like this. They don't say it as many times as Ankyria or in the same way as she does, but they basically put these two parallel columns up, and you're supposed to, oh, yeah, you see this sort of thing. So let's start here. There doesn't seem to be any evidence of the names. Um, he was, uh, he taught from time to time. Uh, but again, let's put the relevant details in. Um, he, was, he did do miracles. Uh, he did uh, have a situation where water was sitting, and uh, this fountain came up, and it, alleged, had, it was alleged to have wine in it. Um, yeah, there are some similarities there, but it, the crucial ones are, are, are completely uh, just, just furious. For example, virgin born. Mm -hmm. There's not a scholar that affirms they're virgin born. Now, they do have virgin born in that in that mythology textbook mm -hmm. I was telling you about. But the interesting thing is, is there's they, they're they're playing with the word virgin. You have to mm -hmm. remain vague about the word virgin. And, and the, the point is, first, the reason Dionysus is called Dionysus is because Dio means twice. Twice born is the idea. Nisus was one in one of the many conflicting accounts of his life. Again, just like Horace, we have a mass of details about Dionysus. I mean, just a mass of details. So, again, you got to, which tradition are we talking about? Very, very late, very, very early. We'll talk about those in a second when it comes to death and resurrection, mm -hmm. but, or death and return. But one of the things you have going on here, Nick, is the, is the whole point of the virgin birth. Let's go there. We'll just start there. You have uh, uh, Zeus. Uh, <laughs> raping his daughter Persephone and, uh, and producing Dionysus initially. And then you have an account that has some, some sort of vague connection with a, with a, with a possible account of, a, uh, uh, of, a, of an earlier writer prior to Christianity where as, a, as an infant, we mentioned this earlier, as an infant, Dionysus is approached by Titans and he's torn to pieces while Zeus is out and Persephone isn't looking. Mm -hmm. He's torn to pieces. The, Zeus comes upon the Titan. You're not able to fully kill them, but he at least stops them with lightning bolts. It, it, it stops them in their tracks and, and, and incapacitates them, takes their power away, initially, at least for that moment. And he, they had thrown the pieces of Dionysus into a cauldron, and, you know, they were boiling him. So they tore him apart, and they're boiling him after they tricked him into getting close enough to do this in order to get a shot at their rival Zeus. Mm -hmm. Zeus is able to maintain the heart, and depending on which tale you're reading, he either strips the heart down and drains it into a glass or eats the heart, or the heart disappears and he kind of takes it into himself, but he's able to turn it into a drink. He offers that drink to a princess in the, in the earth world named Semele. When he gives this drink to Semele, Semele uh, is able to have the twice born born in her, but mm -hmm. it's with sexual contact, at least most scholars say, with Zeus. Yeah. So again, you're playing hard and fast. Is it a supernatural birth? Yes, between two gods in a very immoral scenario between Zeus and Persephone. Is it how about in the one with the earth, earth and maiden? Well, there's copulation and sexual contact. It doesn't look like that this is a, a virgin birth in the same way that the, the Gospels say that. But put that aside. Um, you have a number of conflicting accounts about whether this happens. For example, there's one where Zeus gives her the drink and uh, has sex with her, and then she, she shut up into a, um, into a coffin and put out to sea. And mm -hmm. Dionysus makes the trip, but she dies. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, there's a number of conflicting accounts going on uh, all over the board in the ancient world with Dionysus. Uh, the idea of him being crucified is absolutely preposterous. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of him dying, again, yes, you could say he died when he was pulled apart as an infant, but Jesus wasn't an infant. It wasn't uh, with titans. who were. It, it wasn't a Zeus thundering scenario. His, his, his life force wasn't distilled into a cup to drink as mm -hmm. far as the, you know, given to Mary or anything like that. Um, so, so you don't have that sort of thing. The only other account you go after, besides this infant account, that that again is alluded to in the in the BC data. For example, uh, you have it alluded to in uh, in Ovid, right? And Ovid is yeah. pretty, technically pre pre Christ. Metamorphosis. Again, 
Metamorphosis. This is the infant attack of Dionysus. Yeah, but it's, it's written o Ovid Metamorphosis. Yes, in Ovid okay. Metamorphosis. So, uh, well, you have the clearest account of the Titan attack, though there's conflicting accounts all around it in, in Hyginus, right? Gaius mm -hmm. Julius Hyginus, but he's a second century AD guy writing a, a work called the Fabulae. In chapter 167, you have the clearest account. It's not vague like the Ovid account where it's kind of, well, is this Dionysus? That's why they call it Dionysus Zagreus because it's not, he's not referred to as Dionysus, but there's other features of the tale after the reconstitution of this memory in the twice-born scenario that looks like the later Dionysus. So you have a late account that's the most clear. You have an earlier uh, account that is really, really vague. The only other death in return doesn't even feature a death. Mm -hmm. That then he goes to the underworld uh, by, after making a sexual bargain and entering a cave with a guy. He gets permission to cross it, it, onto this guy, into this guy's cave on this guy's property if, when he comes back, he'll have sexual relations with this male, male, male uh, a character. And he goes down, and he's able to somehow get his mom out of Hades. So he just sort of blends into the underworld, gets his mom out of Hades, and then he comes back and he doesn't do anything in the earth world, he just goes directly to either Olympus or up into space, and him and his mom become part of constellations, him and Semele, the earth mm -hmm. mom. So, again, when you look at one account, you have a seeming death, though it's very vague, and a reconstitution of sorts that's mixed into the virgin birth scenario, and then in the other one, you don't have a death, and you don't really have a return to the human realm of any substance you have going into, like, an ascension scenario. So. So clearly, and, and by the way, that's very late. Uh, the, the, the going to get mom scenario is, is, is a very late addition to the Dionysus, Dionysus account. When it comes to him being to, uh, put to a tree, it's actually referring to Pentheus. Uh, this was a rival of his, a king that wanted to kill him. That's where you get the evil king scenario. Well into his adulthood. And this king is torn apart in one account by his followers. Sounds like the disciples did, right? Torn yeah. people apart and ate their body parts. Um, and, uh, and, and another account where he is literally ripped apart by going up two trees, and those trees are pulled apart, and he holds onto them, and his body is pulled apart. So either way, whether the followers rip him apart or the alternative account, you have the king that's happening to the king. Again, it's nowhere close to a crucifixion not happening to Dionysus. So again, you'd be able to ascertain this if you went to the one, the original source documentation yep. as best you can, and this is what I try to provide in my book, all of them, and say, gosh, this is not anything like Jesus. Even his followers, there's no number 12, there's no, uh, they spread the word after he was gone. Um, uh, there's none of this. His followers were known for having orgies. They were known for eating raw flesh. They were known for uh, pulling apart raw animals and, lie, and eating the live animal without without roasting or boiling them. I mean, it, it, this doesn't sound anything like Jesus' followers at all. Mm -hmm. They were called Manad or uh, the Bacchae. Uh, he was called Bacchus in the Roman iteration rather than Dionysus in the Greek, uh, the previous Greek iteration. So, so you have all of these differences. I mean, even his death is, is, is told differently. In some accounts, he's pushed off a cliff by a jealous king. And in another account, he, he drowns. And, and uh, I mean, there's a number of events that, you know, one, he dies as a, just a weary old king by natural causes in India. So there are a number of conflicting death accounts. There's very few, if any, vague return accounts. And even then, you don't have anything close to a match. You yeah. don't have similar words, similar events, similar purposes, similar meanings. It's not anywhere close to these claims in this list. And when you check them out again, are there any original sources beside any of them? No. no. Um, when, uh, you know when you go in that, that textbook I mentioned at the top of this, this section, you don't have them giving original source data. Yeah. And, they're, and they're playing loose and fast. Let me give you an example in the, in the Harris, uh, in, uh, Harris and Plattsner textbook. They say in one of the connections, they say, okay, um, uh, uh, battle the evil forces. Battle the evil forces. Uh, uh, Dionysus did in the in the infant account. Well, Jesus battled evil forces as well. That's first of all, it's vague. Well, we know that he didn't win over over the evil forces, and it says it says in this account he conquered and battled evil forces. Well, if you're going to go with the account that says he won over the Titans, they don't kill him. Mm -hmm. So you don't. That's one of the accounts that doesn't have him dying and getting pulled apart. He battles with that, and they end up fighting the Titans off. So you don't have him dying in that account. Well, if you're going to use that account, you can't in the same list say, oh, he also died and was resurrected by his father, Zeus. You can't use the same, you understand what I'm saying? You're yeah. mixing and matching uh, uh, competitive, at best, 
if not contradictory at worst sources in your list here. So if you have another one where he says he was killed by Titans, well, you, now you're, again, you're pulling different data that's either before the Jesus account or after the Jesus account all over the board to try to desperately make a case here, and again, not listing any of the dissimilarities as well that would lead you to make a scholarly and responsible parallel possibility. Yeah, one thing that I should point out since you mentioned the sources here is that I'm looking right now and she's got four sources here. First one is herself, her book Christ in Egypt. The second one is that says, it says Karis 49, Mangasalian 74, the illustration Karis cites after Mars Bird I-49 from Baumister Plate 1, page 448. I don't even know what that is because it's not clear enough. Then, it, it, she's referring to, just so you know, she's referring to an interpretation of an impression of art on a plate or a, a plate that's been unearthed and now they're, they're trying to do a, a translation of it. What mm -hmm. we want is something clear that mm -hmm. is done, done by an ancient author. Go ahead. And then the next one is Wright, Third ECR, so Adradars, 327. Like, which one? I mean, does she mean N.T. Wright or does she mean someone else, you know? <laughs> and then, yeah, you're right. the last one is Classical Journal. 92, and I don't know how many of our sources are called Classical Journal, but I'm sure it's several. <laughs> They're not, but at least, hey, at least Classical Journal is pretty reputable. Much yeah. more reputable than the other sources she's at least listed. I'm not familiar with the right, uh, the right passage, no pun intended either. Mm -hmm. But I will say this. Uh, the, the scholarly consensus concerning Dionysus as a match to Jesus is overwhelmingly negative. Even though it's featured in that textbook, so in that sense it's a little separate from some of our other mm -hmm. matches, um, it's overwhelmingly negative, the, the, um, the, oh, yeah. uh, the scholarly consensus concerning Dionysus. And, and, that's, and that's where I, I'm not sure she could pull a single, if not any two, uh, concurring persons that would say, well, clearly. Like, you know, in some of the, in this textbook, they also make a big deal about uh, wine. He was, he was alleged to be a god that gave human beings wine. Really, yeah. You know, was, was something that he was alleged to do in some of the mythological narrative, not ritual or cultic accounts, but in the narrative accounts. Well, Jesus has wine as a part of the Last Supper and his first miracle in Cana. So, so they, you have to really reach to, to connect those two. Um, but they do anyway. Uh, they also say, well, yeah, there was a, an event where, you know, he was, he was in some of the ritualistic accounts later on, have people eating a meal and saying, you know, Dionysus, save us, things like that. Um, again, these are post-Christian accounts, the majority of them. And the ones that aren't just have, just, just have a, a meal. He was not a savior of people from a sinful state. He was supposed to give people wisdom and save them from their human state. Yeah. Their, 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 their state of, if they were, a, you know, if there's an evil king like Pentheus persecuting them and won't recognize him. But, you know, at the end of the day, too, Nick, he's also really, really quite capricious. I mean, you know, he'll kill somebody just for not recognizing his authority, or he'll very vindictive and vengeful. You also you need to know, a, a lot of the things that are left from the Dionysus narrative is that it was a very, not only were his followers crazy, wild, orgiastic, uh, 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 body dismembering, animal dismembering, wild people, but he was known of the, the god of wine and revelry. If nothing else, we know Jesus in the Jewish tradition is, a, is, a, is a, at least a, a god-man of temperance mm -hmm. and high virtue and insight and intelligence. With Dionysus, it's more, okay, well, it, it, it's a push away from that Greek temperance, right? It's more what happens when you're drunk and intemperate and, <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, and real reactionary. You know, so again, you have a real, when you look at the overall picture, you have a, a radical, radical disconnect with either the followers, the rituals, or the narrative. Well, let's go with one more okay. parallel God here, and uh, well, this is going to be kind of like two for a price of one here, and there are many, many more we can touch on, sure. but we can't, so let's go to the Far East, yeah. and again, I'm going to be using Acra here okay. with uh, talking about Buddha, and yeah. Jesus already saying, I mean, we can tie this in with Krishna too. Yeah. Yeah. Buddha's virgin mother Maya was impregnated by the Holy Spirit while a heavenly messenger informed her that she would bear a son of the highest kings. Yeah. Buddha was said to have had five favorite disciples who left their former teacher to follow him, just as was Jesus, whose initial five disciples left John the Baptist to follow him. He was further portrayed as having twelve disciples, same as Jesus. He also depicted as speaking with two Buddhas who had preceded him, a motif reminiscent of Jesus conversing with Moses and Elijah. 
While Buddha fasts and prays in solitude from the desert, he is tempted by the prince of darkness, Mera, whose overtures of wealth and glory the sage resists. Jesus, like Jesus, Buddha is portrayed as walking on water, while one of Buddha's disciples also is able to walk on water at his instruction. Like Jesus, Buddha extorts his disciples to hide their good deeds and confess their sins before the world. Furthermore, Buddha is portrayed as administering baptism for the remission of sin. Buddha's teachings embrace the brotherhood of men, the giving of charity to all, including adversaries, and pity or love for one's neighbor, and Buddha was called the Lion of the Tribe of Sakya, the King of Righteousness, the Great Physician, the God among Gods, the Only Begotten, the Word, the All-Wise, the Way, the Truth, the Life, the Intercessor, the Prince of Peace, the Good Shepherd, the Light of the World, the Anointed, the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the World, the Way of Life, and Immortality. Well, Joe, you must just be living in denial. With all those parallels here, how can you not see the truth yeah, staring you yeah. right in the face? If they were true parallels, we would, we would have some explaining to do. The problem mm. is they're not, especially when it comes, again, the names, sometimes the most spurious accounts are the names, but in those, and those are the least important if they're alike, because why, right? Titles, mm. um, you're going to say nice, high things about beings you worship. So, but, right. but be that as it may, let's real quick try to move through some of this. Um, Gautam, uh, uh, Siddhartha Gautama was uh, born of a woman named Maya, uh, a princess uh, in an aristocratic, high-caste Hindu family. Mm -hmm. uh, his father was a, a king over a, a certain area, a city, a city, and lived on a large estate named uh, Sudhodana. And um, it was said of Sudhodana that Maya uh, was his favorite wife, his mm -hmm. favorite wife. And we assume not because of her cooking, uh, that they also, it's also said in some of the best Buddhist sources that they, they tasted love's delight together before the Buddha was born. So technically, again, there's plenty of contact going on prior to uh, Siddhartha's birth. Mm -hmm. um, again, the, the Maya and Mary thing is ridiculous. Maya, uh, it, it means uh, illusion <laughs> in that language. Mary is from the Hebrew Miriam, which means bitter. Uh, the minute you write the original language, that, that connection that's supposed to be a phonetic connection falls apart and mm -hmm. shows itself to be spurious. Um, he did now, he did, it was said that it, there was a blast of sorts that, you know, that he came down in the form of an immaterial elephant with many tusks, a white elephant yep. that entered the womb of Maya. Yep. So again, she's had sex beforehand, so this is a supernatural birth to be sure. And when he's born, it says he walks on his feet and rose petals kind of come up, but that's an account well after the gospel account. But yeah, there's some supernatural events attached to his life very, very late in the tradition uh, that have him doing things that, quite frankly, aren't what's claimed of Jesus and are what you'd expect of a legend or a myth. Again, not, not only by way of chronological lit after the, the life of the person like this, but also by way of, of just embellishment. And you have a very restrained account. You know, the Holy Spirit overshadowed her, Mary. You know? mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so, yeah, you don't have this, this sort of thing going on. I'm not aware of any account of 12 disciples. Uh, I, I, it's, let, let's go to the central uh, event, death and resurrected. I'm not sure, I've never heard of any, any scholar talk about him walking on water. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of accounts of Buddha, uh, Siddhartha, mm -hmm. after his life that come very, very late, well after the time period of when a legend would accrue or there'd be a legendary accretions for the original, you know, uh, original documentation, or at least closest documentation of the history of Siddhartha that we can get. Uh, he was a part of a royal line, but yeah, Jesus is, was a poor person, an indirect, right, descendant of, of the Davidian line in the sense mm -hmm. of wasn't literally the son of a king, but was born into poverty in the line of the Davidian royalty. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have any sort of, I mean, he died at 77 of, some, some accounts say poisoning, uh, or around between 77 and 80. Some accounts say poisoning, some accounts say he just lay down on a couch next to a river, and that makes sense because he was enlightened under the bow tree by a river. And his disciples, he asked his disciples for a comfortable place to lay down, he lay down and died. Mm -hmm. uh, at 29, he became a monk when he got disillusioned with a life in the palace and the, and the, and the fact that they were allowing people around them in a sanitized environment to, be, to go through suffering, the, the four big sufferings that he saw, old age, uh, poverty, uh, death, and sickness. Uh, and so he went out to find an answer to this and became a, a, a monk at 29. Mm -hmm. He got enlightened uh, in, in his 30s, but his ministry, you know, it went quite a ways as he wandered, you know, north in northern India and on, and the ideas spread to China. Um, you don't 
don't you don't have a death and you don't have a resurrection. It said when you know when he died, he was immediately in this sort of this realm where it's incomprehensible. It's very very different than the, the heaven or even the hell ideal. You know, the reincarnation mm-hmm. scenario is is a completely different scaffolding for afterlife experience. So, uh, yeah, you don't you just don't have this. You don't have it where you need it. The wise men there were wise men in the palace when he was born that warned Sudahana that. Go the wrong way, and wrong way. What we mean by wrong way is repudiate his aristocratic background and become a great teacher. And we think he could benefit the world. But if you keep him here, he'll just benefit you as a as a as a successor to your throne or your your rulership. Um, but there's not wise men coming and saying, "Gosh, we've seen prophecies about this." We know. No, they, they're saying, "Well, well, no. We, we, we think this child born to you and your wife is special, and here it is." But you don't have them traveling. You don't have the star. You don't have any of the accounts that mimic this sort of scenario. And especially when it comes to the crucial details, death and resurrection, Nick, mm-hmm. you just don't have it here. And just so you know, since I am not, again, out of my own mouth, I, I'm not a scholar of this. Let's let's support what we're saying with somebody. And not just because the scholar says it, it's true. We have to test everything. But let let me let me quote the person Mike got in touch with years ago when he was first investigating this. Professor Chun Fang Yu, mm-hmm. chair of the Department of Religion, right, Rutgers right. University. Mm-hmm. I remember Dr. Yu, uh, the special, it was had a specialization in Buddhist studies, had published a lot of translations of different Buddhist texts. Um, uh, Mike offered her the 18 similarities offered on the website that she still has up Murdoch and Karia that you just listed, mm-hmm. and this was the quote from uh, the chair of the Department of Religious Studies, the Buddhist specialist at Rutgers, who I don't believe is a belief, is, is she's not in our wheelhouse, not a believer. None of the 18 are correct. A few, however, have some semblance of correctness, but are badly distorted. And then she listed a total of eight that had some vague similarity, but then when you got into the details, evaporated. Mm-hmm. Dr. Yu ended her, her, mm-hmm. uh, her interaction and her... Uh, uh, her writing with Mike and her interaction with Mike by saying this, the woman you speak of is totally ignorant of Buddhism. It is very dangerous to spread misinformation like this. Um, you should not honor Miss Murdoch by engaging her in a discussion. Please ask her to take a basic course in world religion or Buddhism before uttering another word about things she doesn't know. She was especially put off by the idea of a death and resurrection anywhere like Jesus. She goes, I don't know in any context, even artwork, that has, him, has Buddha being crucified, then resurrected, discussing things with his followers. Um, wait, wait, so, Joe? so again, whether you go with the actual going the actual source data and looking at it, uh, or you go with a specialist who doesn't really share our faith conviction, who spent a portion, a large portion of her life not only translating these things, but being conversant in the original language and also uh, a, a studying Buddhism and being vetted by those who have also done the same thing, um, you find that this, these claims, though, though they're stated strongly, just like in Zeitgeist, the movie. They really fall apart on, on, on uh, further uh, further inspection. One last little point before we finish up. Um, uh, when it comes to the Buddha, um, the majority of the parallels she's adducing, right, uh, come from uh, texts that are late. You've got mm-hmm. a, 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 there's a number. There's some of them that are early. Some parts of the tradition that are early. Uh, there, but there's some of these that are that are late, or even they're either not there, or they're well after both Buddha. Who lived between in the uh, uh, between the uh, fifth and fourth centuries BC, uh, and and even some that come very late, well after Christianity. So it could be an attempt to try to bolster the Buddha, the, 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 the Buddha, which is just you know Buddha's is not a, it's, a, it's a title, not a name. The enlightened one try to bolster his reputation in light of the growing Christian movement. And at the end of the day, the irony is you actually have more in common between Buddhism and Buddha and Krishna than you do Buddha or or Krishna and Jesus. So. Um, so again, even if you go with a critical analysis of the text that she's pulling a lot of these similarities from, there's probably not a lot of listings of original source documentation because that would ruin uh, the connection. Well, no, I was just going to bring that point up because I was just looking for a bibliography, yes. and she has such great one for sources as a, um, well, okay, actually she doesn't have a bi- bibliography of this one, but she she does recommend her book, The uh, Sons of God, about Krishna and Buddha, Together, oh, yeah. so I mean, there you go. How can you beat such great source recommendation as that? There's something, yeah, there's something circular there, but why not, right? Yeah. 
And I take it we take me seriously because you can take me seriously because I said so. Why? Because I said so. And I take it we've only got a few minutes, but the same kind of things could be said about Krishna. Yeah. For instance, as well. Uh, yeah, very, very similar. Uh, Krishna was born of Devaki uh, mm -hmm. after she had already had seven sons, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and his father was named Vasudeva. Mm -hmm. They 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 had a child, um, and and again there was there's sort of a mystical childbirth mm -hmm. scenario, but we're not told that there was an avoidance of sexual contact both prior to or in the act of conceiving him. Though there was some spiritual something going on. They said that something like she transferred some of the, he said to be, you know, one of the avatars of Vishnu, that she transferred some Vishnu. Because, you know, it's in pantheism, everybody's God. You know, Dr. Yeah. Pepper, I'm a God, you're a God, wouldn't you like to be a God too? So she transferred some of that supernatural ness to him. Um, but you, you still have the same thing. There's no 12 disciples. Uh, there's... Uh, 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 Devaki's uh, 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 distant relative is trying to kill him because he's a ruler, Kamsa, but he's born, he has uh, uh, Devaki and Vasudeva put in prison, he's born in a prison, there's no, there's no uh, shepherds coming, there's no wise men coming, um, yeah, he does miracles, but yet he's not, he's not crucified, the death of Krishna is verified pretty, pretty substantially, really, in the material, uh, he's shot in the, uh, in the foot by a hunter's errant arrow. And when he dies, again, scholars, the majority of scholars say he doesn't resurrect. But the hunter that accidentally shoots him is so sorry for killing the blue-skinned Krishna. Oh, and that whole Christ Krishna stuff is, it's just, it's intentionally deceptive. Uh, Krishna from Sanskrit means blackened one. Mm -hmm. Christ means Messiah or anointed one. They're not the same. So making Krishna, messing around with the English transliteration to make it look more like Christ is simply just devious. And, and you haven't, you haven't, you have some sort of feeling come over the hunter as Krishna lay there, as he as he ascends into heaven. It says he felt his presence. So we don't even have him talking to him. There's some sort of mystical communication, but we don't have him walking around or, mm -hmm. or, or resurrecting or being touched or anything like that. And he's certainly not a crucifixion, right? In fact, this looks more like Achilles, <laughs> his demise. So, um, again... Even with all these Krishna examples, uh, the vast majority of them are very, very late. They come mm -hmm. from the uh, uh, the Bharata uh, Purana and the Maharabhata. So it's the, these are two of the two very, very detailed accounts of his life that come very late in the game. We're talking 400 to 1,000 A.D., hundreds of years after Jesus, that have very little connection to the earlier antecedent worship tradition or narrative tradition, ritual, cult tradition, or narrative tradition of Krishna. Okay. Well, thanks for all this information. It's been a fascinating show, and like we said, there are many, many more pagan yeah. copycats we could talk about, so sure. don't even want to think we've been exhaustive, that we've been trying to dodge one or anything like that, and yes. we should point out this book that you're talking about, it's not out yet, is it? It's not out yet, unfortunately. I'm trying to, I, I, I'm trying to, and I'm almost finished with it, um, and, but I'm, I'm going to start shopping it, and it'll be, I, I hope it'll be a great resource, so you just have it. You go right to the original source, at least with regard to death and resurrection. These other claims, I'll deal with those in the footnotes, but the main thing will be death and resurrection, because that's the central event for Christianity. Well, we've already discussed that. You still don't have a blog or a web page, and I, yes, I agree. You need to get started on those, but if someone wants to get in touch with you and find out more about these kinds of claims, do you have a way that they can reach you? I do. Here's the website you can get in touch with me at J M. U L B like Victor I H I L L mm -hmm. at M as in Mountain T as in Tommy Parent P A R A N School. That's my school web uh, web address mm -hmm. uh, or, or uh, sorry email account. And any question or comment, I'm going to respond and, and talk back and, and 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 give you what I can there. And mm -hmm. that's that's a way. <laughs> I know again. I'm a, uh, I'm a dinosaur here, just giving you a website to get in touch with me, with, with which to get in touch with me. But maybe in the future we'll have time to put some of this stuff out and just kind of get yeah. a, a, a larger electronic footprint in the, uh, uh, the web world, right? right? Uh, I should point out that's uh, mountperrinschool.com. Yes, right. Oh, sorry. Did I say it .org? Yeah, no, you didn't say anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. Hook me up then. Yeah. Uh, now, now, with only just a few minutes left in the show, what's the final message you would like to leave with the Deeper Waters audience? I... I just want to say this way. There's hardly, I mean, Solomon was right. There's hardly anything new under the sun. I, I, there's a, there is a history to the pagan parallel thesis. There was a time where scholars took this thesis a little more seriously than they do now. 
and there's, there's a reason why, and there's a reason why it's largely been abandoned by scholars as a critique um, of Christianity. You need to be careful uh, of people that, in any scenario, try to remain vague and don't want you investigating information. Uh, I'm not saying that everybody that's ever believed this sort of thing is like that, but when somebody's scared about, I, I want you to investigate Jesus. I want you to read. Yep. I want you to read with a critical eye. I want you to get out commentaries. I want you to go for it, man. Because I think I, I've seen this this belief stands tall, resplendent mm -hmm. in the face of a barrage. Just Amen. the same sort of thing you'd expect to happen if this is an inspired communication of a, from a higher power. So I would just say, look, be careful of these things. People, you know, guys like Nick and Mike and, and Bill and and Robbie and I. Is that, not to put myself in these guys' category at all. But we can make a lot of money simply saying we don't believe this anymore mm -hmm. and, and, and have a very comfortable life for our families because it's kind of in vogue as we move post-Christian in the country to do this. So just be careful. Yeah. You don't evaluate what people say. Uh, if, I, if you feel like I came on strong and a strong personality in this city, check out what I say. Yep. That's what you got to do. Go do it. And, and if somebody's going to push you to the original sources to see whether this is true, I would say go for it, man. Mm. Read, uh, you, you, you read the coffin text about Horace. Uh, you know, go and look at really substantial, well-respected uh, 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 translations of these people, and, and just put it to the test. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll find what we found in our life that it's not only not only does it stand tall after the test, it's worth shouting about. Well, Joe, I'd like to thank you very much for contributing your time, and I hope we'll see you back here again sometime. Thank you. It was a pleasure, man. I just appreciate giving you an opportunity to talk with uh, people that trust you. Thank you so much. Maybe when the book comes out, we can have you back on again. Sounds wonderful. I'd love it. Thanks, bud. Well, I'd like to remind everyone that next week my guest is going to be Lee McDonald. We're talk going to be talking about the canon of Scripture. For now, I'm Nick Feeders. This is the Deeper Waters Podcast, and I am signing off. It's here, the official Rock Radio mobile app. Listen to your favorite rock radio programs on your iPhone, iPad, iPod, Kindle Fire, Android smartphones, and tablets. The best thing is, it's absolutely free. Download it now from the iTunes or Google Play App Store. Or get a link at our website, cyiworldwide.com. Rock Radio. Christian radio that doesn't suck. You're listening to Rock Radio 2.0.